Thank you very much for inviting me to uh, this interesting meeting. Today, I'd like to talk about uh, our micrometeorite collection, and I would like to also talk about accretion rate of Antarctic micrometeorite using our micrometeorite collection. Um, we are collecting uh, surface snow uh, near the Dome Fuji Station. Dome Fuji Station is uh, here. Uh, Dome Fuji Station is the hub station of the deep drilling project of ice cores, and it is one about 1,000 kilometer south from the Showa Station. Um, it stands on the uh, at, at the top of the ice sheet of the droning moorland, the altitude of the station is three thousand eight hundred ten meters, and due to high altitude, the temperature never exceeds minus twenty degrees Celsius even in the summer time, and the annual accumulation rate of snow is very low, about 10 centimeters per year. Therefore, we are able to collect micrometeorite that experienced almost no terrestrial weather. The situation is very similar to micrometeorite collection at Dome C station. Next, we'd like to introduce our uh, method of collection of micrometeorite. We collect a soft snow near Dome Fuji Station, and the collected snow was transferred to Japan in a frozen state, and the snow was melted to form cold water, and the water was filtered by micropore, omnipore filter, and the fine grain residues on filters were picked up, and the steel microscopes, and all the grains were examined by SMEDS to identify micrometeorite. This table shows six opportunity to collect snow from Antarctica. Total amount of snow we obtained was about 1,000 kilogram. And the number of micrometeorite identified exceed more than 1,000. However, it took 17 years to correct micrometeorite from all the filters. From here, uh, we'd like to introduce some uh, examples of recovered micrometeorite. First uh, one is CP micrometeorite, and that means chondritic porous micrometeorite. That is the counterpart of CPIDPs collected in the stratosphere. And this one is an example of such micrometeorite. And right image shows an enlarged image of this micrometeorite. You can see that there are many, about 200 micrometer sized and spheroidal objects. They are uh, gems, glass with embedded metal and sulfide. That is the, one of the most important constituent of CPIDPs. These gems were uh, are, uh, enclosed by carbonaceous material. And we prepared uh, our present section of the sample. And this is a hard steam image of uh, gems in this micrometeorite. And uh, you can see that uh, based on, uh, you can see that these micrometeorites are enriched in iron and nickel. And uh, it means and gems in this micrometeorite are enriched in iron nickel metal. However, they are depleted in iron nickel sulfide. Uh, by using this type of micrometeorite, we can investigate uh, CPIDP 
equivalent material. Next one is hydrated fine grained micrometeorite. Most are uh, enriched in from whether aggregate of magnetite as shown in these backscattered electron images. In addition, we uh, found some uh, weakly hydrated, but uh, fine grained micrometeorite. We also found uh, scoriaceous micrometeorite that are very common among micrometeorite recovered from uh, bare ice field. In addition, we also found spherules. And some are S type, stony type spherules, and I type, iron rich type spherules. In addition, we also find uh, iron sulfide type spherules, as shown here. This type of spherules have not been reported from the other micrometeorite collections, but this type of spherules exist among IDP collections. And therefore, our micrometeor collection is comparable with IDP collections. And next, we'd like to uh, compare the relative abundance of types of micrometeorite recovered from snow and ice. And, we, and this is Totsuki 5 uh, micrometeorite collection. And in this, this type of collection was obtained by melting of about 11 tons of ice near um, Totsuki point. And we obtained about 30, uh, 3,000 micrometeorite. And when we compare these two diagrams, you can see that a method micrometeorite occupy the majority of the Dome Fuji collection. And low abundance of unmelted uh, micrometeorite in the TOTC-5 collection is probably related to preferential destruction of fragile Antarctic micrometeorite during compaction of snow. Next, we'd like to show the size distribution of micrometeorite recovered from snow and ice. And in both cases, and they have very skewed side distribution. And in the case of uh, Dome Fuji correction, depletion of large micrometeorite. Probably, and this is pro probably related to small amount of snow uh, used in our study. Uh, side distribution of micrometeorites collected at Dome Fuji Station and Totsuki uh, point can be fitted by log normal side distribution, respective of the types of micrometeorites. Spherules recovered from South Pole water well can also be fit by log normal uh, side distribution curve uh, by Taylor et al. 1988. Our result uh, is consistent with our result. The side distribution can also be fit by uh, low power uh, side distribution. Especially in the case of micrometeorite collected at Totsk 5, and the slope or uh, exponent of the uh, side distribution is very similar to the previous works. And next, we'd like to move on to the topic about the estimation of the annual flux of micrometeorite. Uh, we estimated the total mass of the collected micrometeorites based on the assumption that they were spheres with average diameters. And we also assumed that average density of unmelted micrometeorites are two gram 
uh, per cubic centimeter, and that of spheroids as three gram per cubic centimeter. The estimated total weight of micrometeorite in one ton snow was 2.4 times 10 to the minus 7 kilogram, and the surface mass balance at Dome Fuji Station was estimated uh, to be 27.3 plus minus 1.5 kilogram per square, uh, uh, sorry, uh, meter per year uh, by Kameda et al. 2008. And the flux was estimated uh, by using this uh, formula. And annual flux was estimated to be 3.3 plus minus 0 0.2 times 10 to the third ton per year. This value is uh, somewhat lower than the value obtained by Loha Seto 2021. However, and the smaller value may be related to the small amount of snow used in this study because the large uh, micrometeorite are depleted in our collection. Both data are within the range of previous estimation of the annual flux in the past. And at the annual flux of meteoroid at lowest orbit are uh, almost one order higher than the annual flux of micrometeorite and this value is similar to the uh, annual flux of extraterrestrial material based on osmium isotopes. And Rojas et al. also estimated similar uh, values of the micrometeorite before entering the Earth's atmosphere. Based on the data, a vast majority of the accreted material may be vaporized during atmospheric entry heating and the majority uh, may accrete as meteorite smoke on the earth. Uh, here comes the conclusion. Thank you very much for attention. Thank you. So now it's time for the questions. So we've got a question from Cecile. Cecile, I will, I will just unmute you. Which apparently I can't do. Uh, ah, so okay. Cecile, Cecile is... is um, no, I can't unmute you, Cecile. Ah, there we go. So you can talk now, Cecile. Mm -hmm. Oh. Do you hear me now? Yes, we hear you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for this very nice talk. Um, I was wondering if you had this, uh, the, the, the difference between the flux of uh, unmelted and melted uh, micrometeorites from your sampling? Uh, we have not uh, calculated the and uh, accretion rate of different types of micrometeorites not now. Okay. I can I can and calculate and separately. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I th Thank you. There's a quick question from Martin Suttle. Martin, would you like to speak your question? Sure, thanks, Matt. Uh, I'm just wondering, as you extract the particles from the snow by melting them, uh, they come into contact with liquid water. So that might make studying parent body aqueous alteration processes difficult. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there a way that you can extract them maybe from the snow in the future uh, without that contact with liquid water process? Uh, at, at present, uh, we have not um, de uh, determined the effect of contacting water at present. Um, but uh, but um, what we are now uh, collecting micrometeorite um, by using freeze dry method. Yeah, uh, we will. Um, try to check the effect of contacting water 
uh, by using such micrometeorite. And we will uh, try near future. Thank you. I think we, we, we've now run out of time for yeah. the questions. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much, Professor Noguchi. Uh, the next talk will be by Julien Rojas, uh, titled The Micrometeorite Flux at Domsi. And Julien, can I ask you to share your presentation, please? You are muted. Hello. Hello. You can see the presentation? Yes. Um, okay. Start. Uh, hi everyone, I am uh, Julien Rochas. I recently defended my PhD at Paris Saclay University. And I will present to you today uh, the work we have done uh, at Orsay on the micrometeorite flux at Domsi, measured with the Concordia collection. So this work uh, has been published last year in the in Earth and Planetary Science Letters. And if you want to have more information about this presentation, you can also refer to, to this paper. Uh, so first, I have a quick introductory slide. I won't pass too much time on that slide, but I just wanted here to remind that the submillimeter particles that arrive on Earth are divided in two main categories. The ablated particles that, that do not survive the atmospheric entry and the particles that survive the atmospheric entry and uh, reach the Earth's surface as submillimeter particles as micrometeorites. And we are measuring the, that part of the flux, the micrometeorites. So the micrometeorites we used in uh, this study uh, are coming from the Concordia collection. The Concordia collection is a 20 years program uh, performed around the Domsi station in the central regions of Antarctica. You have on this map uh, the position of the Domsi station. And the Domsi station is a very specific place. It's located uh, more than a thousand kilometers away from the coast at an altitude of uh, 3.2 kilometers. And this isolated place below to have very low levels of terrestrial contamination uh, in the snow around the Domsey station. So this enables us to have um, a very good control of the collection efficiency of micrometeorites, which means that, that we are able to make the difference between the micrometeorites and the background of terrestrial particles. And this is because uh, the snow around Domsey are very clean. And then in addition, the Snow accumulation rate at Domsi is very low and very constant. Uh, it has been measured by several studies in the past years. And this uh, allowed a very good constraint on the snow accumulation rate, and thus in the accumulation rate of micrometeorites. Uh, so uh, in the study, we, uh, we defined uh, the exposure parameter S, uh, that is an area time product, to uh, be able to, to measure the accretion rate of, of micrometeorites. So for these two reasons, the central regions of Antarctica around the Domsey station and uh, as uh, Professor Noguchi said, around the Dome F station are a unique place to, to perform micrometeorite collections. So how do we extract micrometeorites from the snow uh, uh, in the Concordia collection? So volumes of snow are extracted in three to nine meter deep trenches. This uh, depths correspond to age of fall of micrometeorites ranging from the 20s to the 80s. So the Concordia collection is measuring the recent flux that have fallen on Earth during the last century. Then uh, the snow are melted and filtrated, and uh, the uh, micrometeorites that have a diameter above three, uh, 30 microns are recovered uh, in filters. For this study, uh, the micrometeorites were divided in two main categories, uh, the unmelted micrometeorites with a density of 1.5, and the cosmic spirals with a density of three. So with the collection protocol of uh, the Concordia collection, we are able to associate to one melt, one filter, and thus we are able to associate to one mass of snow, uh, uh, one exposure parameter S, one number of unmelted micrometeorites, and one number of cosmic spirals. So each melt is an independent measurement of the flux. In this study, we perform uh, a selection of the melts with the highest uh, exposure parameter and the highest uh, collection efficiency. We use that uh, selected data sets to, um, 
derive uh, the absolute value of the flux between 30 and 240 microns. And then uh, we use an additional data set to derive the um, distributions in the wall size range. So the results of uh, this study are here. Uh, these, are, these are the um, distributions uh, of cosmic soils and Elmaton micrometrites from the Concordia collection. So the, in, in, uh, in, uh, here in the vertical axis, you have the mass influx of the particles plotted against the equivalent diameter of the particles. We can state uh, several things with uh, that plot. We can uh, first see that uh, the Concordia collection uh, has a large number of unmetal micrometeorites, and that enables us to, to derive a, a, a distribution of unmetal micrometeorites below 300 microns. And for both cosmic soils and unmetal micrometeorites, we are able to sample the peak of the distribution that is below 300 microns. Then we can also see that we do not have on the Concordia collection enough statistics to uh, derive the flux uh, above 300 microns. And that is due to the fact that we are not uh, working with enough uh, amount of snow, but several uh, other uh, collections, like the TAM collection and the South Pole Water Well collection, do work with very large exposure parameters and are able to, uh, to derive the flux on this uh, uh, higher size range. And the next step of the work was to try to uh, combine the distribution from the Concordia collection with the, the distribution from the South Pole Water Well collection to derive the, the distribution uh, in a broader size range, ranging from 30 to 700 microns. So uh, just here, um, I am presenting to you the uh, South Pole Water Well collection that has been reported by Taylor, Susan Taylor in 1998. Uh, Susan Taylor uh, recovered a large amount of cosmic spherules in the water well of the South Pole Bays. She worked with a uh, large amount of snow and she collected a large amount of cosmic spherules. So the idea here was to uh, combine the very good um, constraints on the cosmic spherules uh, distribution below 300 microns from the Concordia collection, that is due to the good preservation of the samples and the very high statistics of uh, uh, the, South Pole, the South Pole water well collection above 300 microns to derive uh, this, uh, this distribution here in the size range of from 30 to 700 microns. And here we come to the, um, the results of the distribution uh, uh, resulting from the study. Uh, the distribution are posited here. So, uh, the flux of unmelted micrometrites is estimated to 1,600 tons per year with uh, the Concordia collection, and the flux of cosmic soils is estimated to 3,600 tons per year uh, by the combination of the Concordia collection and the South Pole Water Well collection. The total amount of micrometrites flagging on Earth uh, is 5,200 tons per year, and by uh, combining this result with the amount of carbon measured in the micrometrite from the Concordia collection, we estimate that uh, the carbon flux is ranging from 20 to 100 uh, tons per year. So if we compare that uh, distributions to the distribution derived by Lovin Burnley before the atmospheric entry, we can see that uh, the uh, total distribution of the Concordia collection is below, um, uh, uh, is, uh, below the, the flux uh, before atmospheric entry, that uh, makes sense because uh, a lot of particles are lost during the atmospheric entry process. Uh, the last step of the, our study was to uh, compare our results with uh, results of models. So we worked with uh, Juan Diego Carrillo Sanchez, uh, Petro Pocorni, and John Plain that are working on, the, on a model to simulate uh, uh, the drift of the particles in the interplanet medium in uh, the atmospheric entry. And uh, by comparing our results with the results of the model, uh, we, uh, we can see that uh, the two results, are, the two distributions are in good agreements above 100 microns. But below 100 microns, we have large differences between the prediction of the uh, models and the results from the Concordia collection. And that is quite puzzling uh, because uh, in the Concordia collection, we have a good control of the statistics of the particles in that size range. And we do not know uh, now, what are the reasons of discrepancies? And we are still working on it. And uh, it would be very interesting to see what, what, uh, what can explain that, that difference. Still, uh, the comparison of the models and the Concordia collection allow to go back backward and to uh, 
estimate the flux before atmospheric entry and uh, the comparison of the Concordia collection and the models uh, allow to say that the flux before atmospheric, the flux before atmospheric entry is ranging from uh, 10 to 20,000 uh, tons per year with more than 70% uh, of that uh, flux being from cometary origin. And here I come to the summary. Uh, so uh, the, the study, the micrometeorite uh, studied uh, in, uh, in, in this work, we are coming from the Concordia collection. The Concordia collection, the collection performed the central region of Antarctica. Uh, the very uh, unique conditions in, uh, in around the Dome Station allowed to have a good preservation of the uh, micrometeorites. And we are measuring the recent flux uh, with that collection. Uh, and we are sampling micrometeorites that are uh, that have a diameter below 300 microns. The total flux uh, in that study uh, is estimated to 5,200 tons per year, and the comparison with the model allowed to estimate the flux before atmospheric entry, ranging from 10 to 20,000 tons per year, with a large amount of that particles coming from cometary origin. And thanks. Uh, I thank you for your attention. Okay, quite. Questions are open. I, I have one which I've posted in the, the, the chat. So, I, a question about how you're distinguishing cosmic spherules from unmelted and what happens to the scoraceous micrometeorites. So, are you lumping them in with the with the unmelted particles because that will <laughs> decrease the abundance of apparent spherules and increase the apparent abundance of unmelted unmicro, uh, micrometeorites. And are you actually using density to separate the two samples? No, the the, the difference was uh, on the on the aspect on the visual aspect of the particles. The particles are the fully melted particles, and uh, the scoriaceous uh, were uh, uh, set with uh, with the unmelted micrometeorites, and we adapted the density uh, to adapt uh, to to this. Uh, the fact that we expect that uh, scoriaceous micrometeorites are denser. We use, uh, uh, we use a density that is larger than the one used by, uh, by the YADA uh, that have measured the, the density of, of micrometeorites. Uh, um, I, I don't know if it, that's, uh, that's an answer or... Well, the, uh, I, I'm just aware that some, some cosmic spherules, some cosmic spherules can have huge vesicles inside you know re really massive you've probably seen them the hollow ones mm -hmm. and th they're going to have a really low density really yeah, low. But, yeah. i think that this is a is a major question in the in the estimation of the flux and uh, and but even for unmetal micrometeorites uh, the 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 fluffy on nature the porosity of the particles uh, for unmetal micrometeorites and the hole in the particles in the cosmic folds can have a, a, a huge impact in, in the flux but it's hard to have a systematic measurement of, of, of the mass and the density and yeah does anyone else have a question you could just put it in the chat we've still got a couple of minutes Uh, so John John Plain has a question. I'm just saying you so you can talk, John. Go ahead. You can you can actually talk. Yep. Can you hear me? Yep. Great. Um, well, Julian, I'm obviously going to say this is beautiful work. <laughs> um, just a couple of, of comments, really. Um, the Love and Brownlee distribution um, is obviously a very old one and it's uh, yeah. derived by assuming that the dust is um, was impacting on the LDF um, with a constant speed of um, 18 kilometers a second and we know obviously that uh, the dust has uh, a very large uh, distribution of velocities and each depending on the source those are, themselves are different so I think one needs to be careful using Love and Brownlee. Um, but uh, you raised a very interesting point about what's happening at the low end of the particles. Our model, the, the uh, CADMOD Zodi, um, uh, you've shown it there, uh, there's this very interesting discrepancy below 100 microns. Um, I mean, our distribution, which is based on an astronomical dust model uh, from uh, David Nesvorny and Peter Pacorni, 
um, more or less predicts a sort of power law uh, distribution of size as you would expect. So the, your observations that it turns over um, as shown there with the blue and the red um, is a very interesting one if that's really the case or um, there is something about the particles uh, between space and the ice which is somehow <coughs> leading uh, to them uh, disappearing. Um, so I think this is a very uh, important question for the future. Yeah. And, uh, 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 okay, I think we've actually yeah. run out of time. So if you, if you can get back to him, Julian, in, in the chat or something, um, <laughs> move on to the next talk. Thank you, John, for, your, for that comment. Thank you. So the next talk is by Luigi Folco from the University of Pisa in Italy. So Luigi, if I could ask you to share your presentation, please. Okay, can you hear me, guys? Yes. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah. I'm not very familiar with Zoom, but uh, I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> there we go. Uh, share, okay. Can you see me? Yes, we can see the presentation. Okay, so guys, I uh, apologize for missing previous talks or part of them. I, however, imagine that you have um, already pointed out what is the importance of flux studies. Uh, and um, on this regard, I will uh, today focus on uh, the contribution of uh, the Trantatati um, Mountains micrometeorite collection, in, uh, in particular on um, its uh, uh, potential uh, in providing us with a uh, a unique opportunity to investigate the micrometer flux over the quaternary in terms of uh, mass, size, compositional types, and source bodies. And um, uh, this is because you know the, the, this collection has two uh, main characteristics. And the first one is the long accumulation uh, time, which is after one to two million years. And the other one is that the, uh, the result limited bias introduced by weathering or secondary accumulation processes for at least uh, particles in excess of 200 microns in, uh, in size. So for who are not familiar with the, this collection, uh, let me just uh, give you a few uh, hints about it. Uh, so the, the micrometry are found in loose sediments on, on tops of the Victoria land transatlantic mountains. And these are glacial surfaces, the summit plateaus, of granitic nunataks. And uh, the accumulation uh, is uh, within uh, local debris, which is accumulated within cranks or weathering peats or between stones, and it's mostly by direct info. Uh, the unique characteristics of uh, this accumulation is the accumulation age. So we have uh, uh, bedrock exposure ages, uh, uh, beryllium time exposure ages uh, up to 2.3 million years on uh, the um, on these surfaces. And uh, this long accumulation time is uh, confirmed by the occurrence within the same traps of old geological materials, including almost a point uh, five million years old uh, um, ablation debris from a major airbus over Antarctica. We got 0.8 million years old Australasian microtectites, and we got uh, old cosmic spherules, uh, which record uh, inverse polarity, you know, about the Prince Matuyama uh, reversal, you know, about 0.8 million years ago. So it's an old accumulation. And of course, all a long accumulation time means, you know, a large number <coughs> of particles and, and a large diversity. And also, you know, uh, pretty big uh, particles, both cosmic spherules and unmelted uh, or scoriaceous micrometeorites, you can see in these images. Uh, okay, there is uh, weathering, you know, because of the long accumulation in the sediments, uh, and, um, and it is variable from negligible to, to strong, as it has been described by Matthias in his paper, in GCA paper 2016. But we, we, we have a, a good point to say that the weathering rates are low. Uh, and this is because uh, um, some of these cosmic spirals with uh, inverse polarity 
actually have a very little signs of, uh, of, uh, of a weathering, as you can see here in this image. You know, it's a paper by Clement Suave, published in Geology in 2010. And then, you know, we have uh, um, tested several different sites and we run some particle size distribution and the constant square of frequency by type. And we actually see that uh, these parameters are consistent with uh, uh, the least bias collections, including South Pole Water Well, you know, described by Susan Taylor uh, in, um, in the late 80s and uh, beginning of the 90s. So it basically means that there is no selective weathering effects, and there's no density sorting, and no bias introduced by weathering or accumulation processes or uh, secondary accumulation processes or recovery methods. But of course, the identification of the, of the particles uh, in the sediment is, uh, is difficult, is feasible. Um, it's um, it's uh, basically uh, done on, uh, um, um, on a, a sample that have been sieved at, at different meshes and, um, and the identification is done under the stereo microscope. So it's a visual identification so far. So uh, at least down to 200, 100 microns, uh, it's, uh, it's feasible. Below that, so we are working on that and together with the, our colleagues in Boob. Anyway, let's uh, see what are the results that I want to show today, uh, <clears throat> which have been published already in JGR Planets. So basically in 2017, uh, we went on top of uh, Miller Bats again, and uh, we uh, sampled a trap just on top of, uh, of, the, of the plateau, uh, just here over um, on uh, this uh, uh, beautiful um, glacial polish. And uh, we collected 15 kilograms of loose sample, or uh, loose sediments, you know, about, uh, below uh, two millimeters in size. And, uh, from a surface of um, continuous layer of sediments about 70 by 70 centimeters. And uh, we carried out a micrometer extraction from an aliquot of 2.5 kilograms. And that was sieved or was, um, 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 and was, uh, we, we ran some magnetic extraction as well. So, but anyway, you know, uh, from, from a, a subset of, uh, of, um, of this sample, we identified over 1,600 individual micrometers ranging in size between 100 and 1,500 microns. Uh, they were investigated by a means of uh, SCM, both on uh, the whole particles and sections. And um, so we came up with uh, this uh, uh, type distribution. Uh, so we have uh, basically that the relative proportions of cosmic spheroid types is similar to that of a South Pole water work collection, as you can see here. And uh, there's a diagram uh, to the right of the, the, the slide. And then that we got about 70% of the total consisting of an unmelted micrometer, which is a slightly different, well, you know, big difference relative to what has been uh, reported from Concordia just before. Um, um, and within the unmelted micrometer, we have a 70 part, 75%, which are fine grain, which is similar to the what observed at South Water Well collection by Susan in 2012. Um, the, the size distribution, okay, um, uh, as you can see, uh, it is um, it's not monotonic. <laughs> and uh, we have uh, a short head above, you know, uh, 700 uh, microns in diameter. Uh, but we can't, we cannot talk too much about that because we got very little statistics. I think we got something like a couple of dozens of particles in that size. And then uh, we got um, um, a major kink here uh, around about uh, 230 microns uh, and uh, basically two segments. One, which is the main population, which nicely fit a power low function with a, with a slope coefficient of uh, about minus four, which is a gentler slope relative to South Pole. Well, perhaps we don't know exactly why, but perhaps this is due to the fact that we have probably a, a better statistics on larger samples. And then we got this uh, uh, long tail here, 
uh, that we have no explanation, but uh, yeah, it's definitely, you know, um, a data um, for particles below 230 down to 100 in diameter. The distribution by type, size type. Okay, so this is, uh, we, we do not see, you know, major differences between the size and the textural types, except perhaps, you know, for smaller size for eye type um, cosmic spirals. Um, but what is really important to stress here is that uh, when we analyze it, the size range between us, uh, 100 and uh, 700 microns, so we see that there's a bimodal size distribution with a peak at 250, the major peak, uh, which is you know exactly the 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 the, the peak that's been found at South Water Well and other collections, in, and then there is another one, uh, 145, and. Um, so uh, we uh, think that this might be related to the different uh, mechanical properties of, uh, of the precursor materials. So we can perhaps, you know, uh, speculate it could be fine grain versus chorus grain parent body components or hydrated versus anhydrous um, precursor material, asteroidal versus cometary. But anyway, what is important to say is the size is a factor. And this parallels, you know, uh, previous work on uh, the oxygen isotopic compositions of cosmic spirals by Carroll, um, uh, published in 2013, where, you know, uh, the, the main result was that the, 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 the primitive to evolved parent body contribution ratio was four to one, which basically means that the larger dust may come from evolved asteroids and the smaller one from primitive asteroids. Um, then, well, of course, we are um, trying to quantify the, the, the amount of material in the, the sample surface, and we came up with uh, uh, a six, uh, well, uh, 1.6 kilotons of uh, um, extraterrestrial material in the 200-700 micron size range per year. Uh, which is you know, uh, pretty consistent with the uh, model for access estimates, you know, from South Water World, World Well, but also is the same order of magnitude, you know, that uh, uh, from Concordia, as Julianne has uh, talked about, you know, just before us. So if we take into account this data, plus the fact that the frequency by type is similar to the South Pole Water Well collection, we concluded that there no significant change in flux has happened over the quaternary. Um, well, of course, there is a there, there, there is um, a, a certain approximation in this information, and, and the major issue is uh, is the the loose constrained age, um, in the sense that we have a minimum age for the the, the trap, which are given by the uh, oscillation microtectors and the and the, the maximum age is the exposure ratio. So I think in the future, we have to think about how to uh, better constrain, you know, these, uh, uh, the accumulation time. So um, just get, get to the conclusion. So, so the, um, the flux estimate that we got, you know, from, uh, you know, this size fraction between 200 and 700 microns is in the order of a few thousands uh, tons per year, and uh, that the flux over the quaternary hasn't changed much, which is, uh, you know, a contribution to uh, generate a kind of a cornerstone data to investigate the variation of the flux in the geological record. So we have a, a good reference. Uh, the other major main results is the size is uh, definitely a, um, a factor in uh, estimating um, and um, and of course you know we would like to uh, carry on further work and uh, better constraining the accumulation time window uh, perhaps following you know what is uh, Jerome is doing or has done in the Atacama probably will uh, listen to to that later on. And, um, and of course, we would like to explain uh, the modes uh, in the size distribution, which is you know, something which is really interesting. And, um, and of course, um, one of uh, our future interests uh, will be 
uh, towards the 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 the, the, the particles uh, with uh, large sizes because we still have a little statistics on that. And I think this is all I've got for you today. And I would like to thank you very much for your attention. I would like to thank Matthias and the organizer of this meeting for bringing um, us together and discuss about uh, micrometer, which is really splendid. Thank you very much. So, so I'm afraid we've run out of time for, for questions. You were being too interesting, Luigi. So um, I think we need to move on to the next talk. Yes. So the next talk will be by uh, uh, Martin Sato uh, from the Open University, investigating the origin of system of poor uh, perspective micrometeorizing, perspective from large and melted micrometeorizers. Thank you, Matthias. Luigi, I will need you to stop sharing screen, please. Yeah, I'm really bad in the Zoom. Sorry, guys. Uh, where is this? Start new show like that? No. Uh, there should be a button at the top of the screen. Uh, yeah. Okay, got it. Thank you. Okay. So I believe you can all see my screen now. Yes. Great. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity and uh, for uh, taking the lead on organizing the meeting, Matthias. Today, I'd like to talk to you all about a group of isotopically heavy uh, 60 nopore micrometeorites that's been well known for over 15 years now. Uh, and that hopefully we're slowly working out what that group represents and where it comes from. And the work I'm going to be presenting today is uh, largely a product of a collaboration between the UK, uh, French, Italian and German universities working on the Transantarctic Mountain micrometeorites that Luigi has uh, nicely just introduced for us. So it all started with some bulk oxygen isotope analysis of cosmic spherules, uh, initially by Yadda in 2005 uh, and then later by uh, Clement Suvat in 2010. And they both described this population of cosmic spherules with isotopically heavy compositions uh, that don't appear to match any known carbonaceous chondrite group. Uh, and as all good science, the results were repeated many times uh, and have been reported since in Cordia and Falco 2014, Van Hineken in 2017, and uh, most recently by Godaris uh, in 2020. So this is a real group that lots of independent researchers are, are finding uh, when they do bulk oxygen isotope analysis of cosmic spherules. Uh, but there's a, there's a little problem with the definitions, because what we're finding is that uh, anything almost um, that has a isotopically heavy composition, so uh, a large delta 18 value and a positive uh, capital delta 17 value, so a, a isotope composition uh, above the threshold fractionation line, is sometimes grouped as, as this uh, group 4 material. Uh, but I want to talk about a much more confined spread, a little coherent group that we're seeing in that, uh, which is, is perhaps more accurately what we want to talk about when we say, uh, talk about these group four particles. So this is a, a region of isotope space, which has a delta 17 value of about 23 per mil and a delta 18 value of 41 per mil. Uh, and as you can see, it's just uh, a, a little bit above the uh, terrestrial fractionation. Mode. So this is uh, where we came in uh, and the work I'm talking about here has presented, was published in EPSO in 2020. Um, and through a collaboration with um, researchers uh, at Paris, we were able to get time on the Soleil synchrotron um, and use the facilities there to perform micro CT on some very large unmelted micrometeorites that allowed us to accurately characterize their internal textures without uh, sectioning them or doing any of the traditional SEM work. And as such, we were able to direct that then whole mass to bulk oxygen isotope mass spectrometry at the laser fluorination facility we have here at the Open University. And that allowed us to get high precision uh, oxygen isotope data from these particles and to match the textures of those particles to their isotope composition, with the idea being to link textures to parentage. Uh, and we analyzed 14 particles. Uh, and because this was a fairly new uh, process, Unfortunately, three of them had uh, too low yields on the oxygen isotope line uh, 
but the remaining uh, 11 gave us some good data. And among those, uh, we found lots of particles which are consistent with known carbonaceous chondrite groups with CR material and ordinary chondrite material primarily. Uh, but also one of the 60 no pore isotopically heavy particles, and that was a particle TAM 5025. And you can see its texture there on the left hand side, and its oxygen isotope composition on the right in a um, delta 18O versus capital delta 17O plot. Uh, so on this plot, we know that uh, micrometeorites, as they heat up during atmospheric entry, uh, they melt uh, and form cosmic spherules, and then those cosmic spherules undergo evaporation of uh, some of the, the material inside them, and that leads to mass dependent fractionation in the oxygen isotope compositions uh, towards heavier values as the lighter oxygen is preferentially evaporated. And a mass dependent uh, process on this plot will be a horizontal line. So we can see that the TAM5025 composition is um, parallel to the group four population, and if it had experienced more atmospheric entry and melted, then it would experience more of this mass dependent fractionation and we'd expect its composition to evolve towards uh, the group four region. And so uh, on the basis of, of, of our understanding of how micrometeorites evolved during atmospheric entry and the measured composition, we suggested that TAM5025 could be uh, the precursor material to the group four micrometeorites. And if this was the case, uh, then the group four population would be sampling a hydrated carbonaceous chondrite parent body. Uh, so we then attempted to repeat that work and collect a new batch of micrometeorites and uh, repeat the protocol exactly to see if we found uh, more particles. And this is some work that we have currently under review in uh, JGR Planets. Uh, and so we did another 11 particles and among those a further two uh, were isotopically heavy 60 no pore micrometeorites. And so you can see them plotted again on, on that familiar plot on the right there. Uh, and perhaps quite nicely, the, uh, the particle that's sort of intermediate between uh, the, co the two compositions was the one that's, that's more heated and is the scoriaceous micrometeorite. So that's, uh, again, consistent with what we'd expect, it heating up, uh, losing some of its isotopic and oxygen, and then transitioning from its precursor composition towards that group four population. And again, uh, all the material we found is fragments of hydrated carbonaceous chondrite. Uh, so this supports the idea that the group four part, uh, cosmic spherules are sampling a, a originate from a hydrated carbonaceous chondrite parent body. But maybe we can infer something else ab about that parent body. And it turns out that the oxygen isotope compositions of uh, the precursor materials, these 16 no pore microme unmelted micrometeorites, plot in a really interesting region uh, of isotope space. So if I take you back to the 1990s, uh, where Chicago, uh, Clayton, and Maeda analyzed a wide range of carbonaceous chondrites uh, by bulk oxygen isotope analysis and really plotted the isotope uh, field and, and map that we have today. Uh, and in doing so, they realized that the CO and the CMs plot very close together in isotope space. And then alongside many other similarities that the COs and CMs share in terms of say their chondral sizes and uh, the chemistry and isotopic properties of those chondrules, they suggested that the two bodies are most similar and um, could to each other than to any other meteorite group and could perhaps be considered a, a chondrite clan. Uh, and so there you get the COCM clan. And the significance of the COCM clan is uh, perhaps uh, not uh, understood yet. Maybe that could represent material from the same parent body. That's probably a, a less favorable view these days, but it might, for example, represent where the two bodies formed in a same or, or very similar region of the protoplanetary disk, perhaps at slightly different time frames. Uh, and then taking you to more recently in 2019, uh, Ashley and, and uh, King and colleagues at the Natural History Museum uh, suggested that the CY chondrites uh, should be recognized as their own carbonaceous chondrite group. And this was building on a suggestion for the early 90s by Ikeda, um, where they analyzed a group of meteorites formerly known as the Belgica meteorites. And these are a sort of CM and CI-like uh, material, which has been thermally metamorphosed and has these isotopically heavy compositions. And you can see them plotted uh, on the plot here in, in yellow, the yellow diamonds. Uh, and so the 60 no pore micrometeorites we're finding, uh, they plot on this same CM mixing line, which is a uh, trend line in isotope space that unites the COs, the CMs and the CYs. Uh, and that probably represents maybe the interaction between isotopically light solids and isotopically heavy water on the parent asteroid. Uh, and so aqueous alteration resulting in that mixing and, and spreading out their bulk compositions along a, a 0.7 uh, trend line in isotope space. 
Uh, I should also notice a note that it, it could represent, uh, particularly in the case of the CYs, maybe thermal metamorphism and dehydration shifting their compositions to heavier values. Uh, with that said, the 16 poor micrometeorites uh, appear to plot really nicely on this CM mixing line. So that could suggest they have some sort of affinity with the COs and CMs and CYs. Um, now they could be their own new carbonaceous chondrite group, or indeed they could be an isotopic extension of, of the CY chondrites. Uh, and that might make sense because uh, we've only got about nine CY chondrites uh, that are recognized, and that, therefore that isotope space is fairly small. Uh, whereas when you compare that to the CMs, which spread over a very large range, uh, we'd expect perhaps the CY group to be uh, to occupy a bigger space. So these micrometeorites we're finding might indeed be CY material. Uh, now I'm familiar that, uh, or, or, or rather, I'm aware that some of you might not be familiar with the CY chondrites uh, in as much detail as I am. So I'll give you a, a one slide primer. They are uh, sort of intermediate between the CI and the CM chondrites. So they're a hydrated carbonaceous chondrite uh, parent body group. And their most distinguishing feature is their abnormally high abundance of iron sulfides, about 20 volume percent. And all of this sulfide is low nickel pyrotype. Uh, and this is sort of three to four times the amount of sulfur sulfide, sorry, uh, that we find in say the CIs and CMs. Uh, and so this is a really distinctive feature of the group, but they also have uh, a complex aqueous alteration history. So there's both CY1s, uh, which were previously classified as CIs, and CY2s, which were largely previously classified as CMs. Uh, so they've had that aqueous alteration that's then been uh, overprinted by thermal metamorphism. And another feature that, that's quite different from the CMs in particular is that their matrix uh, would have consisted of both serpentine and sodium bearing saponite. Uh, and I've performed a, a kind of detailed analysis of all the CYs we have, uh, and they do appear to have statistically a slightly larger chondral size than the CMs on average about 420 microns. And they have a bunch of accessory phases, some of which like periclase we don't find in other carbonaceous chondrites. So uh, I'm championing the idea that the CYs are, are probably a, a distinct carbonaceous chondrite group. Um, and further to that, these 60 node pore micrometeorites might maybe possibly uh, be samples of CY. Uh, so the logical question is, 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 are those micrometeorites CY material? Uh, and my answer is with three particles, it's really hard to tell at this stage. Uh, so I think we see reasonable amounts of sulfide in these micrometeorites. It's, it's also difficult because uh, some of you will be familiar with the, uh, the fact that sulfides are one of the more volatile phases in micrometeorites. So um, are lost during atmospheric entry more readily than silicates and other components. Uh, but um, so they have sort of you know a reasonable amount of sulfide in. They, they appear to have smaller chondrules, so the chondral uh, data so far doesn't really match that. Uh, but that's also certainly um, hydrated and then dehydrated, albeit not clear if that dehydration is pre or per, uh, during atmospheric entry. So at this stage, we need to find more uh, unmelted. 16 node pore micrometeorites uh, to better understand really what they're sampling. But I'm fairly confident in saying that they are sampling some form of hydrated carbonaceous chondrite, uh, asteroid, C-type asteroid. Uh, and that's that's my whole talk. Uh, so I'd like to thank at this stage uh, STFC for uh, funding the grant I had at the Natural History Museum that did a lot of this work. And also before that, uh, the two Italian grants, PNRA and PRIN um, in Pisa that funded our research, the Sole uh, Access and the Europlanet money that funded our oxygen isotope measurements. Uh, and uh, thank you for listening. So we have, we have a couple of minutes for, for questions. And nobody's put one in chat yet. OK, well, I, I can't see uh, any questions. Uh, I just see my own screen, but uh, just shout or, or maybe Matt, you can read something up. Uh, so Cecile has a question, so let me just um... I've unmuted you, Cecile. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Martin, for this very nice talk. This this uh, group for micrometeorites are really puzzling. Y you said that um, the um, precursor should be on the same um, mixing line, and then you would have a fractionation um, to understand, yes, this yep. um, isotopic composition. So that's, that's more than 10 per mil fractionation. So um, do you think it's just uh, atmospheric entry heating? Uh, so I think that you can you can probably explain the the link between the group four cosmic spherules and these unmelted microintros we found. 
um, by mass dependent fractionation during atmospheric entry? Yes. I believe the an average of about 10 per mil fractionation um, for a cosmic spherical is reasonable based on uh, some of the work Matt and Rudra Srami published last year. Um, but otherwise, I, I'm not particularly, I, I, I don't know how much uh, fractionation we might expect uh, during atmospheric entry. Uh, it'd be nice to say to get um, a correlation between a, a peak temperature we know micrometeorites have experienced and the degree of mass fractionation. Uh, mm -hmm. So that could maybe be done through experiments heating uh, tiny fragments of, say, CM to see how they uh, fractionate. Yeah, because, um, I mean, um... From from the from the particles I looked at a long time ago when I was postdoc at UCLA, uh, we did a bit of oxygen isotopes on cosmic spherules. And then the what's what was uh, interesting is that for the stony cosmic spherules, we don't see so much um, mass fractionation um, from atmospheric entry. For the for the type I, there is a lot of evaporation um, linked to the atmospheric entry heating. But I, I think it would be interesting to uh, yeah have a better quantification of how much material, I mean, you do have to lose quite a bit of material to get this uh, um, as big mass fractionation, so. This I level think, of fractionation, yeah. Yeah. So we we, we better move on, to the, move on to the next talk. Thank you for your question, Cecile. That was a really good one. Yes, thank you, Cecile. So we need to look out for more experimental work. Yes. Hey. <clears throat> Hi everyone, so I'll be taking over hosting just temporarily um, from Matthias um, because Matthias will be giving our next talk and that is entitled A Potential Origin for O16 Poor Cosmic Spherules, a Near Earth Source, source sorry, and Parentage with CY Chondrites. Thank you, Penny. So, uh, Martin uh, talk makes my life much easier because he's already introduced the group four. So I won't go into much detail. So basically, it's uh, based on oxygen isotope studies of cosmic spherules. And uh, you can see this group four uh, defined by Suave et al. in 2010 that has uh, oxygen isotope composition that are potentially not linked to uh, known uh, meteorite uh, groups. So potentially an unknown parent body. And in parallel, uh, Gange et al. in 2017 uh, did work on the settling of olivine in cosmic spherules, uh, resulting from uh, in accumulate olivine textures, as you can see on these SEM images here from this paper. And uh, he defined a new CS uh, cosmic spherules uh, subtype, the Kempo cosmic spherules. A uh, major conclusion is that olivine settling is potentially happens thanks to the presence of radic olivine and high eccentricity of precursor. So, which means that higher entry velocity leads to stronger deceleration and migration of the olivine to the front of the particles. So, thus, this can perform a single subtype, so coherent, coherent subtypes having common origins. Or should we further subdivide Kepo's CS in further uh, subtypes? So, since everyone is interested in group four and Kempo's, but nobody knows what they are really, so it's like bias in the world of cosmic spheres, I wondered, are these two things the same thing actually? Are Kempo's belonging to the group four, isot isotopic group four? So, what I did is I took uh, 15 uh, pure porphyritic olivine cosmic spherules, including nine compos, and I took them for oxygen isotope studies at the CRPG in France and Open University uh, using SIMS and nano SIMS respectively. And the major, I studied the major element compositions at NIPR in Japan. So, six of these compos belong to group four. You can see on the plot on the right, uh, three oxygen plots. And uh, there is a widespread of, uh, these are all point analysis, so a SIMS and nano SIMS analysis, and they all mostly plot in the group four area that Martin was talking about earlier, which is Quite surprising, but not surprising at the same time because I was kind of expecting something like this to happen. 
And what does it mean? Well, even better, this compose exhibit all coherent and similar characteristics. For example, a, an almost total lack of magnetite. Within the particles, we can see some magnetite on the edge of the particles, especially towards the ion enriched area that corresponds to uh, probably to what used to be an ion metal droplet. Uh, four out of six particles exhibit visible uh, ion nickel uh, sulf uh, sulfur uh, bits, uh, not bits, but uh, yeah, bits, sorry, on the, on the side of the particles, especially the one on the bottom, in the middle on the bottom of the image, you can see a clear metal bead here. And they have friction uh, sulfur rich inclusions. You can see these bright inclusions in most of the particles which are extremely sulfur rich, so sulfide basically. And they are all quite vesicular in the finer grain portions. So now the composition of olivine in all these spheres is nickel poor. You can see on this diagram on the right. So even if high finite contents, they are quite nickel poor as defined by Cordier et al. in 2011, plus the presence of metal beads in four out of six studied uh, particles. So it means that the conditions during atmospheric entry were not very oxidizing, so more, less oxidizing in most other uh, cosmic spheres, uh, S-type cosmic spheres, resulting in immiscibility of metal in the silicon melt and increasing a nickel uh, well, not increasing nickel in the metal, a very limited increase in nickel in silicate melt. But another very important characteristic of these particles is that they are very sulfur rich, which is pretty unusual because like Martin said earlier, sulfur is volatile and tends to uh, be extremely depleted or even absent in cosmic spheres. But in this case, sulfur is everywhere. For example, we observe these metal beads that consist of a mixture, homogeneous mixture of iron, sulfur, and nickel, contrary to most, most metal beads in cosmic spheres that are either iron, nickel, metal, or a heterogeneous mixture of iron, sulfur, nickel, and iron, nickel, metal. Uh, furthermore, a defocalized plane electron probe and microanalysis on the silicate portion, so glass plus olivine, of these particles show a uh, sulfur rich composition. You can see these spider diagra diagrams, the composition normalized to C icon rates, and compared to the bulk composition of other S type uh, subtypes. So, so you can see the bad olivine, cryptocrystalline. Uh, glassy and porphyritic olivine. And you can see here on the right, the far right of this diagram, the sulfur, and it's always enriched compared to other types of the subtypes. Here on the lower right is the composition of glass in these particles. And you can see the blue symbols, the, the particles, they are always enriched. So I decided to create a new subtype called the scampo, so because the campo is rich in sulfur, the scampo cosmic spheres. Oops, sorry. And funnily enough, some spheres in a uh, previous study of perforated olivine spheres are sulfur rich, the glass is sulfur rich as well. And these spheres appear to show the similar characteristic, the lack of magnetite. And apart from one case, they really do, do, do look similar. So probably there are also the, one of these scampos in the group form. Here are uh, ele element, uh, major elements chemical maps. You can see that sulfur is everywhere. Again, the sulfur inclusion in the glass and also on the edge of the factors. So now uh, Martin uh, talked earlier about this uh, 1604 fine grain micrometeorites and the potential parentage with CY chondrites so or an extension of the CM mixing line. And so I plotted my particles here on the same diagram showing this CM mixing line. And if we do a correction uh, for mass dependent fractionation and shift the material, the, the particles 10, um, 10 per meter, 10, uh, yeah, delta 18, 10 per meter, delta 18, sorry, to the left, 
it falls on the CM mixing line almost perfectly. So, uh, and coupled with the high sulfide content, which is very unusual in chondritic material, except in CY chondrite, well, I suggest that these may well be, these compounds may well be uh, uh, paired with CY chondrites. Furthermore, there are some relict olivine that, man that I managed to analyze in these particles, and they all plot along, uh, broadly along or in parallel to the CM mixing line, especially one that shows uh, uh, composition within like in the COCM area, suggesting that there is very primitive material in this chemical CS as well. So in conclusion, we have cis chemicals. They have the very peculiar uh, characteristic that are almost unique to this subtype. So uh, I decided to create a new subtypes like that looks really a Korean and uh, that are the skimpos, yes. But we need to call, uh, be careful describing this group for particles, but as, because as you can see in the diagram earlier, the, the group for plots in very extreme area like outliers, these blue symbols, and uh, these are the stars from Yada et al. in 2005. So they are very small, and these may be sampling minor components in parent bodies exhibiting extremely low uh, oxygen isotope signature. So uh, we, the group four may consist in the scampo and other extreme uh, oxygen isotope and, uh, compositions. So the next step will be to explore the orbital parameters by studying the, 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 the textures of these compounds and the, 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 the settling of olivine to see if it comes from very eccentric orbits consistent with a new parent body, which would be consistent with CY as well. Thank you. Well, thank you so are, are, there, are there any any questions? I know we've put one in, in chat yet. So Matthias, the, 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 the real puzzling thing about scumpos, apart from the name, um, is, is the lack of the lack of magnetite. Yeah. Um, well, how do you think that why, why do you think that might be? Well, I think it's the high sulfur content that the sulfur will just predate the, the oxygen while going through the, uh, the, the, the uh, during atmospheric entry, and that will uh, reduce the oxidizing condition, almost reducing conditions, basically. Uh, and potentially, if the parent body was a carbon rich as well, well, the carbon may uh, play a role in this as well to reduce the oxidizing conditions. So Cecile has a question too. Cecile, I've just unmuted you. Yes, uh, thank you, Matthias. Um, this is, I don't know why you can't see me. My, my webcam is on, but I don't know. Um, th this is very puzzling because um, how can you have this uh, sulfur um, resisting in, in the to atmospheric entry in the cosmic spherules? I mean, this, this would mean that you should have extremely, extremely high sulfur in the, yes. in the precursor. Yes, yes, that, that, that's the idea, actually, because I was very puzzled at first, because uh, one of these spheres showed extremely high sulfur content, but then it happened that all these spheres show this very uh, unusual sulfur content, and I think it's because sulfur was extremely rich in the parent material. Mm -hmm. That was oh. the next person in spheres. So. I didn't catch how big was where the sphere was. Where the sphere? Uh, they, they are all uh, smaller than 200 microns, between 150 and 200 microns. Okay, so I've seen several. I, I mean, I've seen uh, cosmic spherules like this uh, in in the Concordia collection. So if you, need I have seen them. others in other collections, and I have a confirmation that these were in the group four as well. So these are everywhere actually. Okay, so okay. if you need more, we we might have some. I'm very interested. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so Matthias, yeah, I I. I... The, the, the sulfur rich magnetite pore, um, it could also indicate there is another reducing agent in there. Yeah. So that's high carbon. Yeah, yes. So, so sulfur is competing with yeah. the carbon for the oxygen. Indeed. 
I think so too. So cometry stuff. <laughs> Could be. Possibly, yes. Yeah, just to say the CY2s don't have magnetite in either, although the CY1s do. So it, it could simply be that there wasn't, I, I realize you could generate magnetite during entry, but uh, not having magnetite to begin with might also help. How much yeah. carbon do you have in the, in, in the CYs? Because they've experienced metamorphism, uh, they have lower carbon and organics uh, contents uh, than say a CM, but I don't have a number off the top of my head. Okay. Um, okay, everybody. So in an effort to try and stick to time, um, we'll start off our second session. Um, and for this, our first talk is going to be given by Jerome Getachuka, and it's entitled Hot, De Sorry, Hot Desert Micrometeorites, Concentration, Preservation and Relation with Surface Ages. Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to this conference. Uh, so this is work in progress about uh, the collection of micro meteorites in hot desert. We've heard a lot about micrometeorites in Antarctica, and this is uh, something else. So I'm going to talk about the concentration, how much you find, uh, how well they are preserved, and uh, what's the relation with the, the surface ages. So the flux of micrometeorites to the Earth, we, we heard a, a couple of talks about, about this this morning. Uh, it's more or less constrained around 3,000 tons per year from work at the South, uh, the South Pole water well and uh, snow melting in different places in Antarctica. Most of these um, micrometeorites in the, in the larger size range are cosmic fuels. So I will talk only about cosmic fuels now. Uh, most of them be, being stony and with a few iron and G type. Um, so these are the, rather than talking in, in the mass, I'm talking about several numbers in this talk. So these are the numbers I've derived from uh, the Taylor et al. 2000 uh, paper uh, about the number of uh, cosmic spherules per um, squared meters per kilo years for this, the fraction above 200 microns. So the, the question here is that we, we know that uh, meteorites uh, accumulates in uh, hot deserts. This is a map here that I've generated uh, where you find meteorites, well, obviously in Antarctica, and then along the tropics uh, in hot deserts. And the, the question was, uh, do we find also micrometeorites on these surfaces? So uh, we've seen the, the collection in, in Antarctica um, uh, with a couple of papers by uh, Luigi Folco and, and collaborators. Uh, so the idea is to find a continental surface that has a low accumulation rate and low erosion rate and to look at the surface here in Antarctica in sediment traps. So these traps in Antarctica were uh, very efficient because they have a very long uh, exposure age, uh, about one million year. And so they allow finding a lot of micrometeorites, including lots of large ones. So we tried to find similar surfaces, uh, long-standing uh, surfaces with low accumulation rate in uh, hot settings, and sample uh, number of sites, most of them in Atacama, spanning uh, 500 kilometers in a north-south direction. Um, then in Tunisia, Libya, Oman, and Iran. And the idea was to look for micrometeorites in the soils in these deserts. So the, the the protocol was fairly simple. Uh, we collected the, the top uh, layer, the soil layer in, uh, in these different deserts. So the, the, with the depth was about a few centimeters before you reach the, the, the hard ground, let's say. And with surfaces typically uh, below one square meter, here you have an example in the Atacama, just collect the top soil. And here in Tunisia, a little bit thicker. Uh, then we sieve the, the soil, sometimes in the field, and uh, do a magnetic extraction of the, of the sand. So obviously you lose the non-magnetic um, cosmic spherules. And then uh, we handpick the cosmic spherules under a binocular microscope and mount them on a glass slide. Here you have, a, for instance, a large size fraction in one of the sites in, in Chile. 
When this is done, we check that uh, we have indeed micrometeorites using uh, SEM, VDS, or uh, X-ray fluorescence. Here we have an example with these particles, and one of them as titanium is terrestrial. The, um, the green one here uh, are nickel rich and are uh, I type, and the other one has RS type cosmic spheres. So then we classify them into the different groups. A few of them are terrestrial, and, uh, but we classify them into stony, iron, and G type. And we extracted about 800 uh, micrometeorites um, during, during this study. They all show uh, rather low terrestrial weathering. And here are some numbers. Um, here you have the total number of micrometeorites extracted, the number per square meter of surface, and the percentage of uh, iron and G micrometeorites, which I remind you is 2% in the Antarctic collection. So what you see immediately is that, is that Atac the Atacama is a, is a good surface with sometimes more than 2,000 micrometeorites, cosmic ferrules per square meter of, of desert. Whereas all the other deserts are, are very low. I mean, we have super low statistics of a, a couple of uh, cosmic spheres per, uh, per sample. So there is no statistical work that can be done on this uh, other hot deserts. Uh, but, and I am going to focus on the, the Atacama uh, collection. So this is the, the, the size distribution that we saw uh, in the South Pole water well with this slope of uh, minus 5.2. This slope has been extended to larger size range uh, with micrometeorites from, uh, from Antarctica. So uh, Luigi has showed, that, showed uh, in his talk a rather different slope of minus 3.9, but uh, okay, it seems that this minus 5.2 slope, at least with this study, extends from a size range of 200 micrometer up to above a millimeter. Uh, uh, so I'm going to use that as a canonical slope. This is a size distribution for one of the Atacama sites um, with a slope of minus 5.4 uh, measured between 250 microns and, and 350. So obviously there is a large drop here. And this is because we, we have not studied yet the fraction above 400 micrometers. So there is a, an artificial drop here. If you look at the overall um, micrometerite collection from the Atacama, you have a similar slope of minus 5.1 uh, in this size range with a, with a rather significant statistics. So obviously there is the same uh, drop for larger size because a larger fraction was not studied. So if you, uh, if you use this slope, you see that studying this kind of collection is, is a good way to find a significant number of large particles. And these large particles can, can be useful uh, for specific studies. These are two studies that were uh, published using these large particles from the Atacama, uh, including one from Matthias about the, the oxygen isotopes. Um, these are more details about the different sites from the Atacama, just to show you the slopes that are usually around 5 point, the, the canonical 5.2, sometimes a little bit lower. Uh, and and uh, an interesting number is the, the percentage of iron and G uh, type uh, cosmic fuels. You see that it's much uh, higher than the, the number you've got in Antarctica. So this means two things, that the, the slope of the size distribution means that there is no or moderate bias towards larger micrometeorites. The slope tends to be slightly lower. And there is a very strong bias towards dense uh, cosmic fuels by a factor of about seven on average. So iron and G spherules are overrepresented. So we tried to correlate this uh, concentration of micrometeorites with surface ages that we um, evaluated by uh, measuring the exposure age of quartz pebbles collected at the surface in the Atacama and in Tunisia. For that, we use the acceleration mass spectrometer that we have at CEREG. Um, in Atacama, we, we obtain uh, old ages, it's not a surprise, between 0.5 and 5 million years and younger ranges in, in, the, in the Sahara. And when we did that uh, using different pebbles at the same site, they usually gave concordant ages. Uh, so there is uh, some significance in measuring this, this quartz pebble at the surface. So now here is the correlation that we see. So I'm showing correlation between the, the concentration of iron and G micrometeorite per square meter with the 
H derived by beryllium time of quartz pebble at the surface. I'm using iron and J uh, type because it doesn't, there is no correlation if you use a stony uh, population that is strongly biased. So these are two, the blue ones are two sites from Antarctica, two sedimentary traps uh, from Antarctica. The yellow dot is a, the site from Tunisia, the only one where we had significant statistics. So there is some kind of rough correlation between the, the age and the amount of I plus G cosmic flows. If you compare that to the theoretical flux derived from Taylor et al. 2000, uh, well, the good news is that we are always below, not above this theoretical flux. And the other thing that you can derive is that you collect a fairly significant amount of the infalling flux of this uh, iron and G uh, micrometeorites, about 34%. That's the, the ratio between the two slopes here. So um, then I'm, I'm putting on top of that the density of meteorites that you can collect on the same surfaces. So obviously, it's a much longer uh, work to do. So I, I, not as many data as for micrometeorites, but in Tunisia, you, you classically find one meteorite per square kilometer. This dot here is the San Juan collection area in Chile, where you have 10, 10 meteorites per square kilometer. And these two uh, here are two areas where you have about 80 meteorites per square kilometer. So there is, a, again, a rough relation between the amount of cosmic fuels at the surface and the amount of meteorites. So in conclusion, um, among the hot deserts, uh, Atacama is the only very relevant one to build collections of micrometeorites with up to several thousands cosmic fuels uh, per square meter. Uh, obviously, the way we did it, you cannot collect non-magnetic ones, B-types, uh, using magnetic extraction. Uh, this uh, cosmic fuel population is biased toward uh, accumulation of dense types and uh, a loss of small particles. There is a correlation between the surface edge and the concentration of these ferrules. Uh, the collection efficiency is rather uh, surprisingly high with about 50% of these ferrules be being preserved uh, over several million years uh, for the I and G types. And um, the concentration of cosmic ferrules can be uh, used as a proxy for the density of meteorites that you can collect on the same surface. Thank you. Thank you, Jerome. Does anybody have any any questions? Or was that you? Uh, I think Cecile was first, so um, I just unmuted you, Cecile. Mm, thank you. Um, thank you, Jerome. Um, this is very interesting. You said that there is a correlation between the concentration of spherules and the concentration of uh, meteorites. So would that mean that uh, cosmic spherules could be mostly ablation spheres from uh, meteoroid showers? Mm, no, I think it's mostly related to the, the fact that the surface is old and stable. So it just means that the, the collection surface is good. And actually, we originally we did this study to select areas to look for meteorites, because it takes a lot of time to decide uh, if an area is good for meteorite collection or not, because you have to cover a few square kilometers, and it, it's very it takes a long time, whereas the collecting for micrometeorites is easier. And then we went back to the site where we had a lot of micrometeorites, and uh, we found also a lot of uh, cosmic spheres. But uh, we found a lot of iron and G cosmic spheres, but also um, a lot of stony ones on these surfaces. So I think it's mostly related to the, the stability of the surface. Mm -hmm. Are you planning to do <clears throat> aluminum 26 and beryllium 10 on the, on the spherules? On the spherules? Yeah. And the spheres themselves, I don't know that we had a, we had a fuzzy plan to do that at some point, uh, but uh, we we have never done it yet. Yeah. No, Matthias, Matthias was uh, was involved in the fuzzy plan. Uh, <laughs> this is something we should do at some point. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Hello? Yep. Right. Um, this is a pretty simple question, but why is the Atacama so much better than those other deserts? 
So it's uh, it's simply because it's an older desert. It's, it has been desertic for over 10 million years. And uh, it's also much drier than any other uh, hot desert in, on the planet. The, the rainfall is below one millimeter per year. Whereas in the Sahara, for instance, it's classically around 100 millimeter per year. So it's uh, older and drier. Thank you. And, and okay. Yep, sorry, I was trying to find my uh, unmute button and it was failing miserably. Um, okay, so, okay, yes, so thanks ever so much for that talk, Jerome. We'll move on now to the second talk of this session, <clears throat> which is going to be given by Jean Duprat, and it is entitled The Concordia Micrometeorite Collection, Recent Results and Future Creation at the MNHN. Um, hello. Do you, do you see my slides? Uh, I'm sorry, do you yes, hear me? Yes, yes we do. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, so yeah, so I will talk to you about the recent results we obtained well, mainly on, on the fragile type of micrometeorite, the, the so-called UCAMs, the one that are very rich in organic matter. So I will briefly summarize essentially the work by, by uh, Julien Rojas and by Noemi Bardin that who did a PhD before Julien. And I will also say a word about the fact that maybe you are aware of that we are moving now to the museum. So I will present you the, the project we've got there at the very end of this talk. So, well, first thing is, uh, of course, it's uh, the, the collection is the one that we perform in Concordia. So there are many collections in Antarctica, as we heard, and uh, there are several that are performed in central regions uh, where they essentially comes from snow. So this is uh, the, the, the collection from uh, uh, South Pole Water Well to a certain extent, even though there was ice at the bottom at, and uh, the collection from Dome Fuji and the collection from Concordia. And uh, in these collections, so this is, <laughs> this is a nice video that Noemi did. Uh, this is, well, the way we proceed as, well, I think most of you know, it's, so it's really a collection within ultra clean snow that we bring back to the, to the station. And the, the key point here is that we've got a good control on the uh, uh, depth. So on the uh, dates of falling of the particles and they are very well protectors, protected in that snow without any uh, mechanical stress. And then we melt uh, quickly the snow and here you see the smelter. And then uh, what we get is that, uh, so this is when we went there with Cecile and uh, now we sort of improve the way we ship back the particles uh, because now we dry the filter very quickly and then we ship them back under dry atmosphere. And here you see the sample coming back in or say in the new lab we've got since a few years. So it's a dedicated clean room in Orsay, uh, dedicated to the collection. So the collection is sitting here and here. And uh, together with the historical collections of uh, Michel Moret, I will say a word about this later. And then uh, of course we extract the particles from the filters and then we fragment them and then we enter them into the database that you see here. So this is a home and database. I just say a word about that because there is an issue here for us is that we want to improve this database, but somehow we would be interested maybe to, to have a talk with you all that maybe we, we, should, um, we should have maybe a common, well, or at least some standard uh, on, on this type of database. That could be an, an interesting idea. So uh, this is the, the, the collection and I will now focus on these particles that are represent a tiny part of the, of the collection, but of course it's the one that we are most interested in. So, um, so yeah, so the main point about the fact that we collect particles in snow, it's the, of course, these are the ones we are searching for. We, we, we do not have, in fact, a very high statistic and, and especially what was uh, the subject of the previous talks, the large spherules, we, we, we don't have a lot. This is not a good 
Concordia is not the good place to have that. And we don't have control on this, on the large, uh, um, on the particles with, uh, with, with uh, sizes over, say, a few hundred microns. We do not have a lot of them. But on the other end, we've got the, the tiny ones and the ones that are, that are almost uh, unmelted at atmospheric entry for some reason. And uh, so we've got quite now quite a lot of them. And among these particles, uh, now about 10 years ago, we found these guys that you probably seen already. Uh, these are the so-called ultra carbon aseous micrometeorites. They, some of them are half carbon, half minerals, but most of them have much, much higher carbon content up to 99% carbon with only a few, few minerals in it. And uh, so we've been working essentially on these particles for the last year. So uh, Cecil will present you things about the minerals within these particles. Here I will more, more focus on the organic matter that you can see here. And uh, so this is uh, Xanes uh, work performed by uh, um, uh, uh, Guérin, P during his, Baptiste Guérin during his PhD with Cecil Engrand. He just uh, defended and uh, he studied this, uh, these uh, uh, with Xanes and Stixem. And essentially what uh, we see is that there, is, there are several types of organics, but some of them, there is a large component that is extremely rich in nitrogen. So uh, this is the C over uh, the, well, the organic matter versus minerals. So uh, ratio within UCAMs, and you see that it's higher than any type of material we know. So we know that there is no parent body who has that type of composition. So there must be a, a way to concentrate organic matter somewhere to, to end up with that type of particles. So that's what we proposed. And uh, oh yeah, just a quick comment also on the, the, the because this is a key point for us, the isotopy of UCAM, which is essentially here the isotopic, uh, the isotopic composition of light elements, uh, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen. These show extreme uh, anomalies, especially of, on the D over H that can be like 10 times, 20 times the small value. So the, the value of the ocean. So a question is how do you make that type of organic matter with extreme isotopic anomalies. So here it's a summary of uh, recent results on the delta, uh, the, the uh, isotopic composition, the delta in, in, in nitrogen here in uh, deuterium. And here we try to, to plot also the carbon. And this is the work by Julien Rochas within his thesis. So here, what we want to explain is how do you make a, a dust? Well, uh, with so much organic matter and with very large uh, uh, isotopic anomalies. And our uh, scenario is that you've got somehow to concentrate volatile elements and within a nitrogen rich medium. And this does exist. It, it exists at the surface of small icy bodies at sufficient uh, heliocentric distance where you can see here, of course, this is a very large body, it's Pluto, but at the surface of Pluto, as you know, New Horizons showed that, that there are massive uh, amounts of, uh, of uh, nitrogen and uh, methane and what happens is that, so you've got nitrogen rich ice because you just crossed the, the nitrogen snow line. And so the, somehow the minerals and the water is locked within the, the core. And, uh, and now if you uh, uh, irradiate this and you don't have the choice be, because this is far away buddy, so they, are, uh, they endure the GCR. And uh, then you can uh, 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 synthesize precursor of organic matter. And then if you sublimate this ice, you will end up with a refractory um, uh, organic matter crust 
like uh, the one that is often seen at the surface of certain comets. So what we wanted to do is that we wanted to test this scenario. So we performed this last year and that was done for the very first time by during Basiloge thesis, where we performed a experiment by irradiating ice on windows uh, with heavy ions, high energetic heavy ions, that this is done at uh, between 0 0.5 and 1 MeV per nucleon. So we are talking about tens to hundreds MeV total uh, energy for the, for, for the irradiating ion beam. And then uh, we sublimated the, the, the irradiated ice and we studied the residue. And what uh, Basile Auger showed during his thesis is that the uh, infrared spectrum of the residue is very similar. Here you see when it's warmed up, uh, it's very similar to UCAM. So meaning that we indeed produce by irradiating very simple ice that you do see at the surface of these icy bodies like uh, nitrogen and methane, uh, you do produce refractory organics that looks very similar to the one we've got in UCAM. So now the, the this was a few years ago. So now uh, the Julien Rochas, what he did is that we tried to see how this can be, how can we explain now the isotopic composition of them? And uh, so basically the idea here, and uh, I'm missing a slide somewhere. Okay, so let me explain it to you. The, I'm missing a slide. It, the thing is that when you, when you um, uh, concentrate, well, uh, condensate the ice, uh, what you do expect if you condensate early in the solar system history is that you will condensate a gaseous reservoirs with various isotopic composition and some of them will have very, very uh, enriched uh, composition, very anomalous composition in nitrogen or in, in, uh, or in deuterium. And when you irradiate, uh, what we did is that we irradiated irregular uh, heterogeneous stacks of ice with at the middle a marked ice, for instance, in deuterium or in, in, in nitrogen 15. And uh, the question was, will, will the uh, residue be heterogeneous or homogeneous? Meaning that will this heterogeneity of the ice, will, that, will it transfer to the residue or will it move, uh, will be, uh, will the residue forget about the heterogeneities of the ice. And the reason uh, uh, you've got it here, and so I flash it quite quickly because there is a lot to say on, about that, but what Julien see with the, so these are the residues that we image with the nanosims. This is the residue on the window. And what you see is that you can have huge heterogeneities preserved in the residue, but this does depend on the type of ice you irradiated. For instance, uh, obviously the nitrogen uh, and CH4 uh, ice does preserve more. The, 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 the movement of the precursor is probably less. So it, it preserves more the in initial heterogeneity than for instance, the NH3 uh, CH4. So this is, well, this is still a work in progress. It's, well, we, we are surprised by some of these results that we didn't expect, but the main message here is that indeed, if you irradiate ices that have heterogeneous distribution within a stack, so to say, then you will end up with a residue that can have a memory of that and you can produce very heterogeneous organic precursors. So now I will finish this by telling you that the micrometeorite collection that we have in Orsay that started with the pioneering work by Michel Moret with the collection from Greenland, the collection from Adelilan, uh, from uh, Dumont-Durville and Cape Prudhomme, and the collection from Concordia. We've got it all here in Orsay in our clean room, and we, we are about to move it to the museum here in Paris, in the Jardin des Plantes, I think most of you know the place, but the thing is that we now have a, a very strong support from the direction of the museum to put this collection here into this historical building. And so we are, we are very happy about this. And, uh, and so the collection will be 
of course, with the with the historical expeditions, especially the polar expeditions that were performed two centuries ago. And so there is a there is also a part of outreach here, of course. And then we will try to see if we can put it in that part of the building together with the meteorite collections and with all the, the terrestrial collections that are within this building. So that's that's our project at the moment for you to say. So I will stop here and uh, thank you very much for, for this meeting again. Uh, looks like we've run out of time for, for questions, which is a shame because that was really fascinating, Jim. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> I was too. <laughs> I, you, Julien, Julien worked too much. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, thank you again for that, that talk, Jean. That was great. Um, so we'll move on to our third speaker then for this session. Um, so this will be um, <clears throat> Geralt Hughes, who will be speaking, uh, sorry, who will give, be giving a talk entitled Building a Collection for the Future, Potential Insights from the NHM's Micrometeorite Collections. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. Okay. Okay, uh, good morning everybody. Thank you very much for coming to my talk today. Uh, something a little bit different, um, but yeah, my name is Gareth and I've recently started a postdoc at the Natural History Museum in London, looking at developing uh, modern and fossil micrometeorite collections and discussing some of the potential uh, insights that we could gain from such collections. So I'd like to thank uh, my colleagues and collaborators and to Raz for hosting this today. Um, okay. There we are. Um, so as we've discussed throughout the morning, there's uh, certainly micrometeorites can unlock uh, a lot of important information that would otherwise be quite difficult to obtain from meteorites. And studies of micrometeorites can inform and complement the findings from studies of larger extraterrestrial material. So for example, it could be used to find you know, parent bodies of material coming into the inner solar system, estimates of extraterrestrial flux, and provide clues on the nature of bodies that would be otherwise quite difficult to uh, sample comets. Um, so as we've heard, modern micrometeorites obtained from polar regions, uh, urban environments, and in this case, deserts, uh, can provide really crucial information on the uh, nature and flux of micrometeorites to the Earth in the present day, whereas micro uh, fossil micrometeorites are becoming more widely recognized in the geological record and have the potential to um, um, have a great potential to understand how fluxes have varied through time and could even be used to understand terrestrial changes through the Earth's history. And uh, with an increasing focus on material coming back from sample return missions, such as those from Bennu and Ryugu, it's becoming increasingly important to understand how to process these samples correctly and how to curate them when they've been brought to Earth. And this is really the driving force behind the need to form a dedicated uh, collection of micrometeorites at the National History Museum and to uh, create protocols on how to process the material. Um, and the uh, modern and fossil micrometeorites themselves in the collection can then be used for to answer fun or investigate fundamental questions on micrometeorites and the processes that they record. So with this in mind, uh, the uh, project that I've just started, uh, the, the work is split into three main parts. First of all, looking at modern micrometeorites uh, in deep sea sediments. Um, second, looking at fossil micrometeorites and how they could be used to understand terrestrial changes through time. And finally, how the building of a modern and fossil micrometeorite collection will fit into the curation and processing of micrometeorites in future. So let's first look at the modern micrometeorites and how we can use historical samples from the Natural History Museum collections to obtain new micrometeorites from old sediments. And for this work, we'll be using deep sea sediments collected during the Challenger expedition, um, as these both have a historic and scientific importance. Um, so for those of you who aren't that familiar with the uh, Challenger expedition, uh, the ship, uh, the Tatumas Challenger, undertook a pioneering uh, scientific expedition between 1872 and 1876. And it was really the event that founded the science of oceanography and spurred decades of research in earth sciences and natural history right up until this day. Uh, the expedition sailed through uh, the world's oceans, taking depth measurements and information on ocean currents and discovering then uh, deepest point of the ocean, the eponymous uh, Challenger Deep, um, and collecting thousands of geological and biological specimens along the way. And it was and it's in these sedimentary samples from the deep ocean that uh, the very first cosmic spherules were extracted and scientifically described uh, in 1874. 
Uh, and as we can see from this extract from the HMS Challenger report, uh, micrometeorites, different types uh, were identified and described. And this work uh, became one of the foundational texts for sort of, uh, micrometeorites. Uh, so there's a, him a tremendous historical and scientific importance uh, of these collections, not only for the museum, but also for the field of meteoritics. Uh, and it forms the basis of the micrometeorite collection at the Natural History Museum today. And so the first part of this project is to build upon this uh, incredibly important uh, micrometeorite collection. The so the first objective is to um, use the historical uh, sediment samples from the Challenger expedition to extract uh, a new collection of these geologically modern micrometeorites. And uh, this is a vast and underserved um, set of materials at the Natural History Museum, and it's likely to contain an abundant collection of micrometeorites, so it's effectively there for the taking. Um, and these uh, studies from micrometeorites will also allow us to constrain the geologically modern flux of material to the earth. So as we've been discussing in various points today and assessing the effect of the storage of these micrometeorites on the sea floor and when these, they've been in contact with ocean waters, these can be compared to relatively pristine Antarctic micrometeorites and also uh, fossil micrometeorites, which may have been subjected to more uh, pervasive alteration and diagenesis, which I'll touch upon later. So now the NHM collections not only contain an abundance of geologically modern material, but also ancient sediments, and they can be a fruitful source for micrometeorites from throughout geological history. So uh, extra extracting, uh, extracting micrometeorites, micrometeorites from these ancient sediment residues um, can be a, a brand new source of fossil micrometeorites and can uh, drastically improve this collection. So our first objective for the project, uh, from this side of the project, is to extract micrometeorites from ancient sediments and to use these collections to constrain the flux of material to the earth. Now this has previously been done for certain periods of the earth's geological history, such as these Triassic micrometeorites from Onoe et al. Um, but these studies have often targeted periods of the geological column, investigating parent body breakups, for example, in the Ordovician, and investigating uh, atmospheric conditions in the Archean Earth, for example. But there are large parts of the geological column that remain virtually unexplored with regards to micrometeorites. Uh, so in this, in this case, we'll focus on a specific interval from the late Silurian through the Devonian and into the early Carboniferous. And we're looking specifically at a very well-constrained stratigraphic section of deep sea limestones from the Ural Mountains. Now, the chronology of these stratigraphic sections are relatively well constrained from micropaleontological studies, and this will allow for a more detailed constraint of the flux uh, during this period of the Paleozoic. After extracting a sizable number of micrometeorites, we're aiming for approximately 70. Uh, the second aim is to develop an atmospheric proxy to understand changes in the oxidation states of the atmosphere through the, this period of Earth's history. Um, so the Devonian period is of specific interest to geologists and to paleo paleobiologists, um, as it was during this time that the evolution of vascular plants and the colonization of the land led to large increases in atmospheric oxygen concentrations and a decrease in CO2 during the Carbonif up to the Carboniferous. Um, this is really a watershed moment for life on Earth, so it's very important for us to understand. Um, and we'll attempt to constrain the oxidation state of the atmosphere through collecting I-type micrometeorites principally. So these I-types are typically composed of iron nickel metal, brustite and magnetite in varying amounts. And the relative amounts of these three phases are related to several factors as shown here by Tom Kins et al, which can include uh, the entry angle, the, um, the initial speed, the entry speed, but crucially also on the availability of oxygen and the oxidation percent potential of the atmosphere. So relative amounts of these three phases in the micrometeorites can be compared, and then the degree of oxidation in the eye types can be estimated and ideally quantified. So, and these constraints can then be uh, hopefully used to produce a new climate proxy based on the micrometeorites. And then finally, the storage of the micrometeorites on the sea floor in sediments and their subsequent liquefaction can result in alteration and diagenetic effects. And these effects are still poorly understood. So although I-types are relatively robust, 
other micrometeorite types uh, may be diagenetically altered by sort of interact and yeah, can affect their composition and texture. And this was shown by a paper in 2017 by Martin and uh, uh, Matt Gensch. Uh, so as a third objective uh, then for this study, it's, it's to better understand how the storage on the seafloor and alteration during diagenesis can affect micrometeorites. And this can be done um, with comparisons to the pristine Antarctic meteorites and the modern material from Challenger. Um, and this, if we incorporate um, other constraints on depositional conditions so, uh, from micropaleontology, such as uh, conodonts, this can also help us to understand the effect of diagenetic processes on the micrometeorites. Now, this is a relatively young project. I've only just started. And uh, so far, the project has mostly been involving uh, extracting micrometeorites from ancient sediments. Uh, so recently, we, um, I've had the first micrometeorites mounted and imaged, and so far a total of 35 uh, I-type micrometeorites have been extracted from this first tranche of samples, uh, dating from the late Silurian to the Devonian. And the subsamples of micrometeorites which have been imaged and analyzed so far uh, appear to be mostly composed of iron oxides uh, from brucite and magnetite, uh, with very little uh, nickel in them, and they, they said to seem to be dominated by the uh, blocky equant uh, magnetites and dendritic brucite. Um, and so they seem to be classified as the metal bead free OX type cosmic spherules. Although I have to stress that these are very, very preliminary results, and that the imaging and the analysis of other micrometeorites from this tranche and from other samples will likely yield a far more diverse set of micrometeorites in their compositions and their textures. Uh, so this is very much a kind of First, uh, first stab in the dark. Uh, but nevertheless, these are really interesting finds and it proves that micrometeorites are present within these ancient sediments and that they are readily extractable. Um, and as far as I'm aware, they're the first micrometeorites that have been identified from this period. And so finally, I'd like to say just a few words on curation of these micrometeorites. Um, so the NHM um, has one of the largest and oldest micrometeorites collections in the world. Um, However, there is a clear need to develop the micrometeorite collections further. And so a part of this project is to also help uh, devise standard protocols for the extraction, processing and uh, of micrometeorites from both modern and fossil material. Um, and this will help be useful to help inform future work on sample return missions from parent bodies. Um, the, result, the results and from studies on the new micrometeorite collections will also generate new knowledge on fossil and micro, modern micrometeorites, and interdisciplinary studies uh, with curators and researchers from different disciplines will also help enhance those collections in turn. And finally, uh, the project we're focusing on at the moment um, focuses on modern and Devonian sediments, but there's a wealth of micropaleontological work at the Natural History Museum with a large amount of sieved and separated residues from acid dissolution of sedimentary rocks, which are simply not being used. So there's a potentially a wealth of micrometeorites available from uh, across the geological column, uh, which has a huge future potential to understanding flux through geological time. So uh, thank you very much for listening. Yeah, well, does, does, anyone, does anyone have any questions? There's nothing in chat at the moment. Cecile has a question. Let me just unmute you, Cecile. Hi, um, this is very nice that you want to expand the micrometeorite collections. I think it's really great idea. Mm -hmm. I, I had a, a question about the, um, the iron type spherules because mm -hmm. uh, we sometimes have trouble um, knowing whether they're extraterrestrial or not. And, and I was actually talking with uh, uh, Julia from the Natural History Natural History Museum in Wien, Vienna. Mm -hmm. And um, some of them sometimes don't have nickel in them. And I, I'm, I don't know if they are extraterrestrial. You said that the ones you found in the sediments have very little nickel. Yeah, these ones, um, I think they need to be uh, sort of uh, reanalyzed, I think. I think they, they seem to be quite low in nickel, but I think um, they, they're perhaps polished only at the surface and they need to be polished uh, throughout to the, uh, to the center for them to be kind of confirmed as extraterrestrial materials. Um, but uh, like I mentioned, this is very much the, uh, the first stab at um, extracting these micrometeorites, but they, they certainly seem to, um, yeah, they certainly, yeah, seem to, uh, they, seem, they seem to be more of a, a surface feature which needs to be uh, investigated further, I think. Okay. Thank you. If, if you can find a, um, 
like um, um, find out the criteria to to to, dec to decipher whether they are extraterrestrial or not. That would be very useful for mm -hmm. everyone, <clears throat> especially also for the urban collections of meat or micro meteorites. I think. And John has a question too. John Plain, I've just unmuted you, John. Thanks. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that at Leeds, um, we run um, a, a, a global model uh, up to 140 kilometers. And we've recently started uh, doing studies of the early Earth during the low oxygen period and, and actually looking at where um, uh, uh, cosmic dust will ablate in the atmosphere. It's at a very different height from the current uh, period. and. Um, so it might be quite interesting when you're a bit further down the road in this project uh, to have a chat to us about uh, perhaps trying to sort of provide you with some uh, data on that. Yeah, certainly. I think this is a kind of a key question is uh, where, where in the atmosphere are they ablating? Because if, the, um, if the oxygen concentrations are, are different throughout the, um, throughout the atmosphere, then that could influence how these, uh, how the oxidation of how the oxidation state would appear in these micrometeorites. So yes, that is certainly something I'd definitely be interested in. Yeah, it's not just the oxygen, though. The total density structure of the atmosphere is different. So that affects mm -hmm. where the ablation occurs. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Welcome back. So we'll uh, start the post-turn session now. So the idea is to uh, allow uh, the, the posters to be Introduce briefly, and then there'll be time for questions. So we'll start with the poster of Sarah Roberts, titled Stardust Hunters. Okay, thanks. Can you hear me and can you see my poster, my presentation? Yes. Yeah, brilliant. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Sarah Roberts from Swansea University. And I'm just giving you a brief introduction to my poster about the project Stardust Hunters. So the Stardust Hunters project is, um, it's a pilot project. So it's an 18 month project that we had STFC funding for. And as you can probably tell from the title of the, the project, it was inspired by John Larson and his project Stardust, where he's been hunting for urban micrometeorites. And I just thought when I read about this, because I do a lot of public engagement and outreach, um, being an astronomer, and I just thought this would be a fantastic way to get school pupils interested in science using something, you know, space that they can actually hunt for themselves. So it's a pilot project, as I say, based in Wales, and we're trying to get school pupils excited about micrometeorite hunting. And it's a collaboration between Swansea University Astro Cymru, who run um, educational space workshops, Oriel Science, which is Swansea University's public engagement project, the National Museum of Wales and the National Botanic Gardens of Wales. So we're basically covering South and West Wales. So the aim of our, of our project is to get school pupils aged eight to 14 years, um, so upper primary and lower secondary school pupils, to contribute to real research. And we're aiming the project initially at underserved communities and schools that are in deprived areas of Wales um, in South Wales, and which unfortunately we have a lot of. And we want to just engage them in exciting science and show them how exciting research can be. Um, and so we're, we're trying to get them to, we're showing them how science works and getting them to plan their own investigations. And if there's any young scientists in there, then trying to enhance and encourage their ambitions. To do this, um, we've come up with a Stardust Hunters toolkit, um, which we take around schools and we'll send out to schools. And this includes um, neodymium magnets, but they're specifically for children to use. So they're quite large ones. Um, we've got a set of sorting sieves that we put in there. We've got USB microscope. Um, we've got plastic bags and we've also got some sample micrometeorites, which um, we got from Scott Peterson, who I believe is, is talking later on. So we want them to actually see what it is that they're looking for when they're, when they're doing their surveys. Um, we run workshops in the school, either in person or online. 
Um, we've got written materials, which are bilingual, Welsh and English, to help guide them in how to plan and carry out a scientific investigation, because that's one of the skills that we want to sort of um, help them with. So once they've sorted through finding potential samples, we encourage them to send us send us the samples to Swansea University, um, where we've got undergraduate project students um, and myself and a couple of other scientists in the um, engineering department. So we're ready to go through their samples and using scan and electron microscopes, possibly the X-ray microscopes, we're actually going to go through what they actually find and then get in touch with them and see whether they found the maybe the first Welsh micrometeorite. I don't know if, if they've been found before. So our results so far, okay, the project started a month before lockdown started, the pandemic, and I was actually still on maternity leave, so it had a bit of a delayed start. Um, but so far, we've reached over just, well, just under a thousand school pupils in various educational settings, so not just in schools, but also in in places where you have pupils which are not in mainstream education for various reasons. Um, we've done online school workshops as well. And we've held, an, the, we've held a lot of um, popular public workshops in festivals like Cardiff Science Festival in the Welsh language, Eisteddfods. Um, and we've been invited to run a workshop for schools at Cheltenham Science Festival this June as well, based on what we did in, in Cardiff. So, we haven't analysed any samples yet. I've still got them to go, but I'm, I'm waiting for my undergrad project students to, to get up to date with, with how to use all the, all the equipment and everything. And I need to, to get up to date with that as well. So basically, I just wanted to present this to everyone because um, we'd like to grow our project once our funding finishes in August and we're going to be going for more funding as well. So if anyone's interested in collaborating or would happy to be sort of scientific advisors or give us any advice or feedback, then we'd love you to get in contact with us. Thank you. Thank you. So now we'll uh, have a... Uh, Stephen. So I have a I have a question for you, Sarah. Um, so, so are, are you thinking about also looking at non micrometeorites? Because you know, the school kids may not actually find a micrometeorite in the in the short time that they get to look down the microscope. And of course, there's going to be plenty of other interesting particles in there. So categorizing different types of particles from different sources. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. Um, we hadn't even thought about that, to be honest, because we were I was very focused on oh, bits of dust from space. Um, but yes, um, we will look into that because we, we want them to be able to basically follow the scientific method. So if that's something you know that we do in science, which is categorizing different things, then that's actually that's a good idea. I'm going to write that down now. <laughs> there, there is a great question from, from um, uh, Steve Evans saying, what is Welsh for micrometeorites? Oh, we could ask Gareth this. Um, my, well, uh, micrometeorite is micrometeoronai, so micrometeoron. So it's not that much different. <laughs> okay, so we'll uh, have uh, Stephen brother is uh, present his poster now. Please, quickly. Thank you, Stephen. Sure. Um, it's a bit small in this format, so I don't know what you guys see. We see the poster. Can you see the full poster? The upper yeah, the full poster. or the full, the full poster? Okay. But we have a. I mean, uh, every, anyone can download the poster from the website directly. So okay. it's not the oh. Works for me as well. So thanks, uh, first of all, for taking uh, some time out of your lunch break, your breakfast break or uh, dinner break huh? to stick with me for five minutes. And also thanks to the conveners. It's quite nice to, uh, to talk meteorites after these two years of uh, pandemic. Um, so as you all know, basically, um, the chemical and oxygen isotopic composition of fully melted um, cosmic spherules changes during their transit through the atmosphere, um, mostly as a result of volatilization with mass-dependent fractionation as a consequence. Um, 
but also due to mixing with uh, atmospheric oxygen. And following the isotopic work of several other groups of, uh, of um, uh, workers in, in the past, we've uh, that have focused on iron, silicon, magnesium, but also like uh, chromium and, um, and nickel. We have developed in, uh, in this uh, study um, iron isotopes using uh, nanosecond laser ablation multi-collector ICPMS. And we applied this in combination with um, major and trace element concentrations and oxygen isotope ratios on a very large set, a large set of cosmic spherules extracted from the um, sedimentary deposits in the Suriname Mountains of East Antarctica. Now, given my five minutes, I won't say much about the deposits, um, but you can imagine something uh, fairly similar to what uh, Luigi was talking about earlier this morning, but then uh, in East Antarctica. So the idea was basically that we can use um, next to the chemical compositions, also the isotopic um, uh, fingerprint of these particles um, to, to correct for the mass dependent oxygen isotope variations. And basically we've subdivided this work in three main parts. The first one was focused on method development, um, as there's quite a few things that you need to tweak when you're working with nanosecond laser ablation. Um, but uh, as you can see in, in the first part of this uh, poster, the upper part, you can, you, you can notice that basically for the, um, the glass reference materials, but also for some of the cosmic spherules that we uh, used to, to optimize um, these measurements um, and that we then extracted from the mounts uh, and um, isolated and measured in, uh, in, in wet conditions, we have fairly good agreement. Huh? So basically we could prove that the, uh, the accuracy and precision of the method is, uh, is uh, not too bad at all. And this was published a couple of years ago in analytical chemistry. Now, in terms of uh, chondritic uh, cosmic spherules, um, that was the second part that we started to work on. Um, basically, uh, five minutes is very limited, but let me say that iron isotopes are a very promising tool for routine application to cosmic spherules to, to at least to correct for the mass dependent fractionation as a result of volatile losses. And as such, we can maybe uh, uh, better refine some of the precursor materials. Um, so first of all, um, let me skip this, this left part here, but the middle part, you can see that basically on this, based on this relationship between iron isotopes and oxygen isotopes, we can correct for some of the volatilization. Um, uh, what is then the, 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 the last unknown, of course, is the mixing with atmospheric oxygen. And basically this is often very um, variable. This is what we can tell based on our analysis. And as such, this, uh, this uncertainty, there is some uncertainty that remains, of course. So, but when, when we apply this uh, correction based on this linear relationship um, observed for part of the particles, then we can basically use this kind of classic uh, clement sauvet plot to correct for some of the chondritic particles. And we see that they plot at least uh, significantly closer to the chondritic fields. Um, while for the ordinary chondrites, there is a, a lot of clustering, which means that we may be uh, able to define a single correction for um, the oxygen admixture from the atmosphere. We see, however, that for the carbonaceous uh, chondritic particles, there is much more uh, scatter. So um, it, it looks like we, there, it, this will be the next step to, to tackle. Um, so for um, three out of the four previously identified uh, cosmic spherules group, we can connect them quite well to uh, chondrite groups with more uh, confidence. Uh, very important in this context, and we've talked about this uh, group already this morning, is that two of the particles that cluster, uh, that do not cluster together uh, before the correction, they do cluster together uh, after the correction based on iron isotopes. So it makes them part of the group four particles. Now, as the final part of this work, we also applied this to achondritic cosmic spherules. And basically, after doing a similar kind of uh, approach in which we first use the iron to correct for the mass dependent fractionation, and also uh, we use a, um, uh, a constant value of eight per mil for the mixture of atmospheric oxygen, we have two of the four particles plotting very close or actually within the, the HED field. So these can be linked to vestoids, but two of the other ones do not match any known meteorite fields. So um, we interpret this either as an incomplete uh, correction for the oxygen admixture or uh, alternatively a previously unsampled parent body together with the major um, and trace elements, we can uh, refine this uh, a little bit. So overall, I think um, what I, the, message, the main message that I wanna give with this presentation is that um, next to adding uh, a bunch of isotopic proxies and we can think about 
uh, revisiting silicon, magnesium, and potassium. We also need to um, remember that the elemental proxies um, are pretty powerful already. And um, if we can uh, continue this kind of work, uh, obviously we also need to think about partially unmelted or even uh, fully unmelted um, micrometeorites. Given the you know, um, significant improvements in the instrumentation over these last few years, we will then be able to also apply these to smaller and smaller particles or even other types of materials such as microtectites or interplanetary dust particles. And with that, um, I will leave you. Thank you. Nice talk, Stephen. I will uh, move on to the last poster, and uh, then we will have plenty of time to ask questions to the three uh, presenters. So, yes, Floor. Yep, so Floor, you can share your screen, I think. I think you're muted. Yes, this should work now. Yes. <laughs> um, so I think everyone should be able to see my poster now. Um, yeah. All right. It's not full screen, but we can see the poster. Uh, I can zoom in this way, so I, uh, that's why, uh, I, uh, I did it like this. Um, first of all, uh, hi everyone, my name is Flore. Um, thank you for, uh, for organizing this and for letting me uh, say something here. Um, it's nice to have uh, some interaction after uh, two years of a lot of uh, working from home and uh, limited conferences and meetings. Um, so today um, I want to talk about uh, exploring the potential of uh, sedimentary micrometeorite traps in the Arctic. Um, the first part of my poster focuses on Antarctica because um, we have a lot of uh, collections of micrometeorites from Antarctica from a lot of different environments. Um, we have the South Pole water well collection from ice, the Concordia collection from snow, um, and then the two collections from sediment traps, Surondana Mountains and Transantarctic Mountains, and um, some other that uh, there was no room enough for on my poster. Um, and all of these collections uh, have been introduced today already or uh, will be introduced further this afternoon, so I won't uh, talk too much about those. Um, but from all of these different collections, um, it became clear that Antarctic micrometeorite collections um, are very, very valuable to, under, to well, studying micrometeorites, um, and they have some very uh, some advantages um, to uh, over other uh, collection sites on Earth. Um, so they are characterized by long accumulation times. There is little to no anthropogenic contamination, and most of the particles have a highly pristine nature. Um, also, weathering remains limited because of the cold and dry climate. Um, and this is all seen in the large variety of micrometeorite types and other extraterrestrial debris like airburst, airburst particles and microtectites that have found there. Um, but um, mainly, I think, possibly because of my love for the Arctic, I was wondering why are we not looking at that similar environment on the other side of the world where it's also cold and dry and there might be some possibilities to find similar collections or at least try to, to look at it. Um, and people have looked at, uh, for example, Greenland snow and cryokonite, but it's been a while. And since that time, um, our uh, methods to find the, the micrometeorites have um, uh, improved. And I think it's worth to go back there and uh, see what we can find. Um, and we have some preliminary results because, um, well, because of my love for the Arctic, I go there often myself on holidays and I brought some stuff back um, from Greenland and Svalbard. Um, and, there is potential there because um, from Greenland, uh, from one location, I brought back 532 grams of sediment and found one uh, cosmic spheral in there. Um, because these were not dedicated field trips to finding micrometeorites, I had to do with locations um, I was at. And uh, the Greenland micrometeorite comes from a glacial moraine. Um, 
that you can see here. So it's not ideal because there was a lot of material there, um, but still in that 500 grams that I brought back, I found one micrometrite. The same goes for uh, Svalbard. Um, I was there in the winter, so uh, it was there was snow. I was at the higher altitude, um, and there were some patches of sediment left uncovered. And I brought back um, some, yeah, some sediment to study uh, back home. I did that from two places, and um, in 800 grams of sediment, I found seven cosmic spherules. So the particles I found were small; they were about 100 to 200 micrometers in size. In size, they were all cosmic spherules, and the particles were relatively altered, ranging from 1a to 2b on the weathering scale that was introduced uh, by Matthias a couple of years ago. Um, but there is potential there. I like to compare it by if I would go outside here in Belgium and I would grab somewhere 500 or 800 grams of sediment, the chance that I would find eight micrometrites is rather small. You already have to go look for specific sites. Um, to find uh, the, this amount of micrometrites. So despite the random sample locations I went to and the little amount of sediment that I analyzed, I still found cosmic spherules on both locations, which in my opinion makes it worth to explore the Arctic further during designated field trips. Um, and in the future, if you would go there on a field trip, there are some things we should focus on. First of all, that's the retrieval from uh, of micrometrites is from high altitude locations that are not covered by glaciers, similar to the sediment traps um, in the Antarctic. Um, second, uh, we have to take into account the background sediments um, because, uh, for example, that location in Greenland has a lot of uh, mafic deposits, which may, um, yeah, um, obscure the signal of the micrometrites and give a lot of volcanic particles that can be. Um, mistaken for micrometrites. And uh, finally, we would have to determine the cosmic ray exposure age of the accumulation surface to have an idea on the age of these collections or how long the accumulation windows can be. And lucky for us, there are people working on that in Svalbard already. So uh, if we could maybe uh, see to go to the similar locations, we don't have to do that ourselves anymore. So um, I'm quite excited to see what the Arctic has to offer. And uh, I hope you are too. Thank you. Thank you. So now it's time for questions. But three questions. So it looks like uh, Sean has a question. Is that right, John? Let me uh, unmute you. So you're un unmuted, Jean. Uh, I don't know if you hear me. Yes, we hear you. All right. Yeah, uh, I fully agree about the interest of Arctic. Uh, that's quite true. It would be it would be really nice to go back there to search for micrometeorite. Uh, still, there is one thing: is that the the precipitation rate is really high there. Um, so it's it's not that easy to to find places i mean it's not the same as as south wall for that uh, but do you do you know if by any chance you could have access in greenland to places where you could have uh, cryoconat holes because they do tend really to have these huge concentrations on co in cosmic spirals and on melted grains we still have a lot of them uh, from that type of sediment, and it's so efficient to 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 get them. Um, I read the paper for the cryogenites, and I know that there is a lot of material in there. But at the moment, I don't have any contact with a person working on cryogenites or. Um, yeah, working with them or, or I don't have access to it, but it's definitely worth further uh, exploring and see what the possibilities exactly are for the Arctic environment. I know that there is more precipitation and that there is probably more weathering, but I think it would also just be interesting to see the difference with the Arctic and Antarctic collections then, and maybe to understand better the weathering processes here on Earth and we can compare it then and it just would tell us a lot more about everything. 
Yeah, I agree. The, the thing is that probably for the cryoconite holes, you, you may, it's probably the locals or the people that are working in these fields that can really give you some, some clues on where do they observe this type of uh, either holes or uh, sediment at the bottom of uh, uh, transitional lakes, lakes that form during the summer, because this can represent huge amount of water uh, concentrated uh, with, with all the, the content of the, 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 um, the ice concentrated within these cryoconite sediments. And it's just that they are so rich in micrometeorite that if you are working in, in this place, especially in Greenland, not really Svalbard, Svalbard is really something different, I think. It, but but it's, it would be very interesting indeed. Um, many years ago, I looked, I looked at some of Michelle's cryoconite yeah. samples. Um, does, does, doesn't, don't the microorganisms absolutely love eating micrometeorites? Well, they tend to do. I mean, <laughs> it's true that there are, some of them are really altered. But still, you can find a lot of, uh, you can still do quite a lot of things on, 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 the, on a part of the collections. It's just that there are so many grains in there. We yeah, I agree. Some material is better than no material. Absolutely. We have some uh, historic cryoconite uh, deposits at the Open University. Uh, I sent some to Scott Peterson and he picked a few particles out, but it wasn't easy. Um, however, I'm sure if you wanted to, to look through the floor, you could, uh, uh, we, we can probably send some to you. That would be great, thanks. Any, any more questions for any of the, uh, there's one here from Susan Taylor. That was a comment. Um, for any of the, any of the poster speakers. If I may, uh, floor again. Uh, so you said that the particles were very weathered. So did you characterize the weathering products by any chance? Uh, no, not yet. It's been kind of a side project um, the last year, uh, well, the last uh, month. So I haven't been able to fully determine them. But in the future, we want to make okay. Arctic kind of a goal. So um, I will look into it further. Yeah, it would be nice to compare with uh, Antarctic micrometeorites. Yeah. Because I know that in the, the uh, surrounding mountains, you already also have a lot of weather and micrometeorites. So and it, different than the ones from the transantarctic. So. Yes, 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 very different. Mm -hmm. Mainly because the transantarctic ones have a lot of uh, gerosite in yeah. them due to sea sprays. I have a uh, question for Sarah about the sites you're asking or suggesting the students search for urban micrometeorites in. Uh, normally, people like Scott and, and John Larson look on rooftops. I assume the students aren't going on rooftops. No, no, they're not going on rooftops. No, we're, we're getting them to do it in their in their playground playgrounds in the in the school premises. And if, if the school caretaker can get stuff from the rooftop, then we're encouraging them to do that. But no, no, there's there's a lot of health and safety involved in getting kids up on roofs, so it's not it's not worth it. But my my undergrad students who are who are part of this project as well, they will be going. So in Swansea University, the physics department is on a on a high-rise building. We've got something like eight floors or nine floors. So they're going to be sweeping the roof of that tower um, building to find that, see if they can find some more amongst all the seagull poo. Great. Yeah, no, I think, I think that would be really useful, particularly because 
as Matt suggests, you'll probably find things like fireworks, ferials, and those of other anthropogenic stuff that is not very well characterized. And knowing better, you know, what their compositions are to pick out from micrometeorites will be helpful. So okay. yeah. any yeah. tiny bright spherules that look like micrometeorites, either way will probably be useful. So. Honestly, seeing the kids, because they they have the the uh, micrometeorite from Scott Peterson. So when we're saying, well, you're looking for something spherical and they they picked up all this all this stuff, all this debris, their faces, when they even see anything that's spherical in there, they get so excited. So even if it's not from space, yeah, if it can be useful, then then I can encourage them to, to do that. So, so one, 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 one thing you, you, you can do is, because um, one, one of the keys here is, is composition. And you know, there's a lot of metallic, a lot of iron oxide spherules out there. Um, um, and quite a few of those are, are industrial, you know, yeah. chromium in them or titanium, whatever, um, is, is using a scanning electron microscope. And, and there are portable, well, desktop scanning electron microscopes that you could take into schools. Mm. And I've, I've done this my, myself for a, for a documentary, for Sky at Night. We went up on the on the roof of the building. We scraped some material. We shoved it in an oven and dried it. And within within half an hour, we had it in the SEM, wow. uh, which was really interesting. They do have rather a hefty price tag. Yeah, I'm just thinking if I still about hundred k. Okay, so you'll, you'll need need some funding, but it might be the sort of thing that that you could reasonably do when visiting a school. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Thank you. <laughs> Is the SEM on the space station uh, really good for the stability? <laughs> but, um, I'm blown away by the idea they have an SEM on the space station. What do they do, Mike? Do they just nip outside to grab some samples? It's a mochi. Do you know the mochi? Sorry, Mike. Yeah, it's it's a mochi. You know mochi? No. Oh, it's a yeah, commercially available SCM with about uh, ten inches on, on a on a side. It's very tiny. Well, about a foot tall by about ten inches by ten inches in in SI in, in English units. Sorry, uh, and it works fairly well, amazingly. Um, yeah, that's that, 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 that's pretty impressive. So they, they just turned it on and got to work finally after banging on it to get it, they had a problem with it. But uh, so you'll see more about it soon. It's, it'll be coming into more use. So they have, they have the option, I guess, uh, the possibility of pulling the materials exposed outside and taking a look at them soon. Um, I don't think it has, I don't know if it has EDS yet. Um, right. Having it work is just an amazing uh, result so far. People working on it here. It took them years to get it that far. Well, of course, they had some kind of secondary electron detector in on um, Rosetta, didn't they? Yeah. You know, the amazing thing is, like, the difficult part was getting a vacuum in it. You would think we have no problem at all on space station getting a vacuum. Yeah. In it. But in fact, getting a vacuum to, to operate properly was a big problem. Uh, I don't understand why exactly, but it was. So any, any other questions related to the posters? Or indeed a question about one of the earlier talks that you didn't get to ask? I may have one to show him if he's still around. Show, show, 
this is this is where we catch people out. Yes, John. Oh, I'm here. <laughs> yes. So, but uh, weathering in the Atacama collection, uh, did did anyone uh, study this? The weathering. In this no. In my talk, uh, I mentioned it was relatively low, but it has not been studied specifically in details. Uh, mm. I mean, it's low because the, when you look at the with the SEM, the spheres look uh, pretty nice. But uh, we've done a few uh, sections, some of them, and they look okay. But we we don't we haven't done any systematic study. So because that's. I remember we run CT scans in the past and uh, we could see some uh, dissolution of silicates on the surface. Yeah, something. on the rims. The, the oh, rims have clearly dissolutions for the silicate uh, particles, but uh, uh, I'm not sure how it compares with the uh, Antarctic ones if you, if you want to compare the depths of the dissolution uh, cracks and these things. So okay. that's something that should be done. Yeah, yeah I will do it then. <laughs> yeah, I, I was about to. To ask you. <laughs> yeah, we we noticed when Matthias and me were working on it, there was really large differences in the degree of of weathering, um, and and I think in part that that's something specific to the Antarctic, where where the presence of water can vary from one millimeter to the next in the deposit that you might get these these meniscus hanging on on certain grains and so they become intensely altered whereas you've got one that's that's really close by that yes. hardly altered at all in antarctica i guess that uh, because some of the surface have several million years of uh, exposure you can have fresh fresh ones and maybe you have a few ones that are uh, three, four million year old, and they will be more weathered. So I expect there is a range of uh, of weathering state. Mm. And uh, snow cover may be quite important too, um, because you you're effectively sealing the surface. You know you can't you can't get radiation coming to them and causing a thermal island effect and and, and melting some ice. So I, I would say that uh, I am I am taking screenshots and, and posting a few things on Twitter, uh, saying how good your talks are. So some some positive promotion here. Please do not be offended if I didn't post about your talk. Uh, it doesn't mean that I thought it was rubbish. It just means that I didn't have time to copy the screen. I was I was handling questions or something else. It looks like we have questions from uh, Susan and John. Matt. Yeah. yeah. So let me go to Susan first. So Susan, I've just I've just unmuted you. So you should be able to talk now. Okay, I'm talking. Is that good? I can hear you. you can hear me? Nice to hear your voice. Oh great. Okay. Um, so um, this is going back a, a long way, but I did a bunch of work on the Greenland ones. And they were interesting because I saw them right after when Michelle came to the lab, I'd been working on the deep sea ones for a few years too. And there was a real difference in the weathering in terms of the olivine grains in the deep sea ones, the olivine, the magnesium rich cores were dissolved before the outer uh, more iron rich core, the glass was gone. Uh, that wasn't true for the Greenland ones. It was sort of the opposite for those, for the olivines. And then also the glasses, you know, it's the first time we saw tons of glass uh, spherules because uh, we do have them in the, in the deep sea, but they're not very common. So the glass is less affected in Greenland. <coughs> also, I've been reading about cryogonite holes and they occur right at a transition between the ablation and the depositional part in um, 
in a lot of different glaciers in, in um, not only just in Antarctica or in uh, Greenland, but you know, in some of the other glaciers. So there are some studies on those and some of the organisms that live in them. Um, so because Greenland is melting so quickly, that zone should really expand. And there should be places where you have meltwater pooling and things of that sort where uh, would be a really good place, just like Michelle did with the, with the fast melting river, river sections on the ice surface. OK, that's it. So one of the benefits of global warming for us micrometeorites people. Um, so uh, John Plain had a question, so I'll, I'll just unmute you, John. John, you're, you're unmuted. Muted. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to come back to the business of organics um, in micrometeorites. Um, we've uh, finished uh, actually a couple of years ago um, a study of the kinetics of um, organic carbon and sulfur uh, pyrolysis in um, meteoritic particles sub 100 micron size. Um, and uh, I mean, this is a paper that has been forever at uh, one of the AGU journals. Uh, they cannot get the reviewers to uh, complete the re-review of it. But anyway, um, what we did there was showed that you get uh, very rapid pyrolysis of the carbon and sulfur into SO2 and CO2 at temperatures above 700 Kelvin. And so I was wondering if it was possible to tell from the micrometeorite collection whether a particle had <clears throat> experienced a temperature like that, um, which would then, of course, uh, which would be a nice way to test whether our laboratory uh, kinetics is, are, uh, well, to support or not support them. Um, so I just wondered if anybody who studies carbon, and we heard earlier, about a very big range of organic carbon uh, in uh, various types of micrometeorite, whether they have considered that. Maybe I can answer that. I don't know if you hear me. Yes, John. Yeah, yeah. It's a spending question. This uh, we we asked ourselves many times this question. That there is one thing concerning. The, the particles we we studied the more, meaning the UCAMs, mm -hmm. what we do have is that in most of them, you've got this very, you've got um, tiny little sulfurs all over the place. Mm -hmm. And uh, and this sulfur, uh, I mean, because they are so tiny, they, they, I think they, we present a robust uh, um, indication that the temperature were in fact quite mild because you do expect these ones to 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 be very quickly blown away if you if you have any sort any uh, substantial heating. The other point is that the organic matter itself doesn't show uh, any evidence of uh, strong heating at all. So for the, but, but here again, I'm talking about only these, these very peculiar particles that are the UCAMs that are so rich in carbon. Mm -hmm. Now for the rest of the grain, my guess is that we would, we, we, there should be sign of heating of the organic, but then it's not that easy to, to study because the organic is much lower and so you don't have access, for instance, at a at a clear signature. Well, you do have, but it's 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 embedded into a large uh, mineral uh, component. I'm mm -hmm. afraid I might have, have to stop you there, Jean, uh, because we are uh, on uh, slightly over schedule to uh, start the next round of talks. So. Um, I'll ask uh, Mike Zelensky to share screen now, and he will be talking about olivine and pyroxene in IDPs. Yeah, actually, I give you my slides, so actually, one of you perhaps could show the slide. That'll be, they'll save on projection issues, so someone can do that. Will you or... receive the slides, Martin? And I sent you. Uh, I can't see an email with them. Well, I will share the slides then. Okay, okay thanks. Sorry about this, Mike. 
Yeah, because I didn't see the share screen option down on my screen here. So change it, that'd be really great. And uh, so I apologize that I have a, just a very short talk to show um, uh, with very old data. Some of it really old, probably older than you guys are. I apologize for that. Uh, next slide, please. Great, okay. So first thing I wanna talk about uh, other things than micrometeorites and IDPs. So this is a plot uh, the Dave Frank and I put together of all mean compositions in, in matrix. So these are very small grains comparable to those in IDPs and micrometeorites. All mean range from force on the left to phthalate on the right, each plot. And the, the goal was to compare uh, VIL2 uh, all means to other chondrite types. And you can see on the very upper left that the distribution of analyses for all of these in built two is different than anything else. I mean, uh, I'm not sure what's going on there, but. Matthias, we can, uh, you've, you've uh, got the schedule in front of yeah, the slides. The, the program over it now. Uh, okay, great, Thank, okay, thanks. Thank you. And, and uh, in a second, I'll show you what the IDPs look like. Um, but at this point we realized, you know, there aren't a lot of good analyses for IDPs. And most of the data now data are two, three, four decades old now. And so the major point of this talk now is uh, if you have IDPs in your lab, please make measurements of all the empirical analyses, including minor elements, and give them to me to look at if you could, please, because there is no lot of data there. But note also here that the distributions of the VIL2 analyses are very distinct from the CI chondroids, the third down on the left, the CMs, which are fourth down on the left, and the COs are, I think, aren't here. Oh, yeah, upper right. Um, so they're quite distinct from the CI, CMs, and COs. So uh, earlier there was talk of comparison grading micrometeorites to COs and CMs. Um, you know, so be careful about doing that. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, remember also that uh, that Jeff Grossman, Adrian Brearley showed years ago that the, the um, chrome content of these all beans, especially in the ferroin all beans. Uh, uh, the kind of gets uh, reduced and the range uh, is also reduced as you uh, heat these samples, even at mild throat thermal temperatures of two, three, four hundred degrees C, you see a, a great reduction in the amount of chrome, which is shown here on this plot, um, uh, versus the, the iron content of the olivine. And uh, so keep that in mind. Next slide, please. So here's a plot that uh, Dave Frank and I put together and made measurements using the TEM of matrix olivines and semarcona, which is one of the least altered chondrites we have. And the main thing here is you have a wide range of chrome in the olivine for every range of iron in the, in down below. Uh, this is an olivine, chrome versus iron, and there's a wide range of chrome contents uh, versus iron content. Uh, next slide, please. And then this is Krimka, which is just minimal to maybe 300 degrees C. And you see there's a, a, a great reduction in the amount of chrome in the olive. You're probably forming little chromite grains, uh, which are growing somewhere else in the, in the sample. That's, that's, what's, that's what's going on apparently. So even so all across the range of iron content, the olive, the chrome content is reduced uh, dramatically. Next slide, please. So here are the Bill 2 analyses um, shown as little blue circles. And they're kind of intermediate between what you see for Semarcona unaltered and Krimka slightly thermally altered, but they're more similar, I think, to Krimka. And next slide, please. Shows us uh, shows all the plots put together. And you can see again, the green uh, is Semarcona and the red and blue are uh, Krimka and Vil2. And the analyses for Vil2 uh, are really more similar, I think, to Krimka um, than uh, to Semarcona. And so next slide, please. So uh, does this mean that uh, common Bill 2 all of these experience mild from metamorphism, either similar to Kermit which is like 300 degrees C? Uh, so is this a thermally metamorphosed comet? And, uh, and also, if this has happened, you know, where did this heating happen? Uh, was it in some other environment before uh, the grains were incorporated into the comet, or is the comet? Heated to that degree, at least, at least, in, at least locally, is that possible? Um, just to open questions. Uh, next slide, please. So, move on to IDPs. How about IDPs? Well, first, um, as I mentioned before, the analyses of 
of minor elements and all the nicotinoids are very few in number for IDPs and micrometeorites is more probably. And most of the analyses I'm going to show in a minute are biased towards either lime olivines, which are which are very low in iron to begin with, which makes them lime olivines, and uh, and also in refractory IDPs or IDPs, specific IDPs that contain refractory minerals, which are also kind of a biased selection. Um, and few of these published data contain minor element information. Um, but for what we could find in the literature, and I probably missed something, please tell me if I have, what do these data indicate? Let's go on the next slide. So here we show uh, on the right um, data for anhydrous and hydrous ID, chemotic IDPs. And these are data that I collected myself back in like the 80s and 90s. These are really old data, but they're, they're not biased. I just selected random IDPs from the collection and made analyses of all these descriptions in them. Um, but I didn't make an attempt to measure minor elements because I was dumb, right? And so that's too bad. Uh, what you see here is distribution of all the uh, commissions for the anhydride piece, and IDP is very similar to the VIL2, and it's quite distinct from CMs, COs, uh, or, uh, or CI. It's a little bit similar to the, C, the reduced CV chondrites, the ones that are not metamorphosed, which is very interesting to think about that. Um, uh, and then for the uh, hydrous IDPs, what you see is the iron red chalabines are gone. And you see that happening during aqueous alteration. If you have some organics present, the iron red chalabines tend to disappear faster than the magnesium red chalabines. Um, that depends on the organic composition of the, of the fluid apparently. So the IDPs are similar to VIL2. Um, next slide, please. How about minor elements? Well, there just isn't a lot of minor element data for these olivines. These are data I, I, I took from Christopherson and Music from the 80s and Wolfgang Clock, which are just for lime olivines. Uh, my work, the two analyses we managed to get for minor elements. And then recently, Dave Joswiak has some data for these, again, are kind of a biased uh, selection of IDPs. These are ones that contain these, um, also contain these uh, sodium rich uh, pyroxenes, we call cool grains. So these are all kind of a biased selection of analyses. Uh, so as you're shown here, this is again chrome versus iron. And if you put the next slide on, you can see that these yellow dots are are uh, probably most again most similar to Vil2 and Krimka, more so than for the unaltered Samarcona olivines. Um, again, there just isn't a lot of data here, um, especially for iron rich olivines, make this a very uh, uh, you know def definite uh, conclusion, I think. Um, how about micrometeorites? Next slide. Well, here's some data from a paper by Elena Dobrika. Um, and she plots, again, chrome versus iron. Uh, and apparently, it's also, it's, it's uh, all the plus pyroxene now from shown here. And these are uh, Concordia samples, which include some UCAMs, but uh, others that are just, you know, uh, I think porous, relatively unheated micrometeorites. Um, and the point here is that they look a lot like the Bill 2 samples. Suggestion here is that the micrometeorite olivines and pyroxenes are very similar to the VIL2 samples, which are quite distinct from CMs and COs. We'll think about that a bit. Um, and so I'll go on to my final slides here. Uh, so there are no conclusions, all there are, are questions and implications. But first, uh, recall that this scale by gross and Brearley of the chrome content of olivine was determined for larger olivine grains in chondral, type 2 chondral. So is it in fact applicable to fine grain all beans in the matrix? Probably, but we don't know for sure. Um, but if this heating did occur, if the scale really is appropriate and heating did occur, where did it occur? Um, uh, is the all bean and anhydrous IDPs and micrometeorites, they've been heated, they appear to be heated to about 300 degrees C. So if these are from comets or some fraction from comets, do these comets experience heating? Uh, even though it's mild, and if so, did this happen on the comet or rather in some prior setting? Um, we call it comets also contain CAIs, so it's a prior setting is certainly uh, possible. But we don't see, you know, we don't see in the built two, we don't see any grains that are both high iron and high chrome, which suggests that they've all been heated. Um, and finally, did this heating occur, could it have occurred during atmospheric entry? Or collection or during collection and aerogel. So maybe these samples are all heated during collection, either by the Earth or, or by the spacecraft. Maybe that accounts for this heating. We just don't know. Um, next slide, please. 
So a determination that a comet or its accretion components have all experienced storm mechanism would, would greatly alter models of early solar system history. But there are a lot of caveats here, uh, a lot of unknown things. But we, what's certainly true is we need a lot more modern IDP, Albine, and Piercing analyses, especially for minor elements. And so if any of you, uh, you've seen a, a missed a paper that contains these, if you have data from your past work, you haven't published it, uh, or if you have a chance to do collect work, uh, collect analyses of minor elements, especially for IDP, all of the uh, please help me out with this. Um, and uh, that's the main part of my talk is please think about that. And next slide, final slide. <clears throat> Acknowledgements, uh, and at the very bottom, here's just a little, a little plateau, a, a tableau of analyses of IDPs, uh, cometary grains, etero grains, cosmic dust in the atmosphere through the years. And Jack Warren's long since retired. Um, now, Captain McBride and Carla Gonzalez are doing that work on the airplanes. So these questions are decades old, uh, but unfortunately, a lot of the data is also decades old. So I'm hoping that someone can help bring this up to date. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'll let Matt handle questions for maybe maybe two minutes, should we say, because yeah. Late. So it's a question from uh, Cecile. I've unmuted you, Cecile. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, that's very nice, uh, Mike, that you put this together because it's really nice to have an unbiased view of the what, what the IDPs are made like. Like you said, the, a lot of the literature is uh, biased toward interesting um, IDPs. I, I was wondering the fact that you said that um, the mild heating to 300 degrees, so this is by comparison with uh, uh, metamorphosed ordinary chondrites, but does this, um, is this responsible for the lack of the uh, phosphorite 100 peak or is it something else? Lack of the what, I'm sorry? The peak, of the, the peak of the composition, of the, the magnesium pure and members oh. in the peroxine. Yeah, I don't know. Um, uh, I think it wouldn't affect the iron magnesium concentration at all. All it's gonna affect is, is things like manganese, calcium, and chrome in the, in the olivine. Um, I don't think so. Okay. But it is interesting that the that the only but the only chondrite that's similar to Hill two is is the, the reduced CV chondrites. No one's thinking much about those. Right. We need to go back and compare micrometeorites to those as well in some respects. Yeah. And just to uh, to make a comment to the plot of Elena that you showed, these, these are only chondritic uh, micrometeorites. There is there is no UCAMs in there. Oh, okay. Because. In your abstract, you said that there's some new camps considered in the paper, but I didn't know what was in the plot. So thank you for that. Uh, and also, finally, I want to say thanks for inviting me to this talk. It's nice seeing you guys after like two years. Uh, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay, we, well, we should should move on. So I'll hand back to Martin. Great, thanks, Matt. No one suspects the CVs to be <laughs> linked to the commentary dust. That was really interesting, Mike. Thanks. Uh, so next we have uh, Daisuke Nakashima talking about oxygen isotope compositions in cometary dust. Uh, uh, one moment. So Nakashima, I promoted you to panelist, so you should be able to share your screen now with us. Hello. Hi, we can hear you. So let me share my screen. Uh, Sorry. Do you see my screen? Yeah, we can uh, see your screen. That looks great. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for inviting me to the interesting meeting. Uh, today I'm talking about oxygen isotope study of cometary dust. So the high temperature at mineral assemblages such as conjure-like particles and CAI-like particles have been found from the particle returned from Comet V2 by the spe uh, Stardust spacecraft. The oxygen isotope data uh, of these particles and single mineral particles are plotted in the 
oxygen-3 ice diagram. X-axis is, is delta O18, Y-axis is delta O17, and here is TF line, and these are slope one lines. As you can see, the oxygen isotope uh, data show bimodal distribution. If we, uh, if we add uh, oxygen isotope data of CAIs and chondrules in chondrites, the plot goes like this. The O16 rich site overlap CAIs and O16 poor site overlap chondrules. So the uh, two particles are similar to that are similar to uh, CAI and conjures in terms of mineralogy and oxygen isotope ratios. And the particles may have formed in the inner solar nebula and were transported to the comet forming region. But uh, one question still remains, where in the uh, inner solar nebula is the source region of the conjure-like two particles? So uh, these, Two view graphs show uh, oxygen three isotope diagram for uh, two particles and conjures. Open circles are FeO poor particles and field uh, circles are FeO rich ones. As you can see, uh, two particles and carbonaceous chondrite conjures uh, are similar in that FeO poor object have more O16 rich isotope ratios than FEO rich ones. In other words, uh, capital delta 17 values, which are the deviation from the TF line, uh, increase with decreasing Mg number. In the next slide, uh, I show you a detailed comparison between V2 particles and various types of carbonaceous chondrite conduits using capital delta 17 values and Mg number. So uh, these view graphs show a comparison of capital delta 17 values and MG number, MG number for uh, virtual particles, CO, uh, CR, and non coverage chondrite conduits. The uh, virtual particles and coverage chondrite conduits uh, show a negative trend that capital delta 17 value increase with decreasing Mg number. So uh, which is a result of addition of uh, O16 poor water ice to the relatively O16 rich anhydrous precursors. Negative, negative, uh, negative capital delta 17 values are common to FeO poor uh, particles and type one conjures, but uh, positive and negative capital delta 17 values are only observed for FVO poor particles and uh, CR chondrite conjures, uh, type two conjures. So a similar trend is observed for giant cluster IDPs. So the capital delta 17, 17 and MG number trend of virtual particles and particles from uh, giant cluster IDP are similar to that of CR chondrite conduits. So the uh, previous studies suggested that the source region of cometary silicate is a CR conjure formation region, but one question still remains. So uh, this is schematic illustration of protoplanetary disk. The formation region uh, of formation region of uh, CR chondrite conjures may have been located at the outer edge of the conjure formation regions from which conjures and mineral fragments were transported to the comet forming region. This argument is based on the comparison between chondrite conjures and particles from only two comets, but there are more and more uh, comets in this region. So the question is, do silicate in all comets originate from the CR conjure formation region? I will address the question based on the oxygen isotope analysis of randomly sampled cometary micrometeorites and IDPs, which may be coming from the various asteroids, various, various uh, comets. 
In this study, we analyzed four samples, three micrometeorites and IDP, one IDP. The samples are observed with SEM and bulk mineralogy is analyzed with synchrotron radiation X-ray diffraction. The samples are emitted in epoxy and microtone. The microtone thin section are observed with TEM and potted bud uh, are observed with FESEM. And finally, oxygen isotope ratios are uh, measured with uh, ion microprobe. In this talk, uh, I focus only on uh, FESEM, FESEM, FESEM observation and oxygen isotope analysis. These are the backscattered electron images of four samples. And these black holes are the seamless, seamless spot uh, indicated by this yellow triangle. The first one shows a conjure like texture and consists of FEO rich olivine, glass, and sulfide in magnetized rim uh, produced by uh, atmospheric entry. This sample is a uh, type 2 conjure like micrometeorite. <coughs> the second one uh, contains gems like lime olivine and cool grains. Olivine and pyroxene show Mg number variation from 65 to uh, 97. So this sample is gems bearing a micrometeorite. The third one here uh, could be UCAMM because of high carbon content based on SEM EDS analysis. The sample consists of FEO pore uh, pyroxene and plagioclase uh, anosite and fine grained matrix. The last one, uh, anhydrous IDP, composed of FEO pore uh, pyroxene and sulfide. This paragraph shows uh, oxygen 3 isotope diagram of four samples and cometary micrometeorites and IDPs in previous studies. X-axis is delta O18, Y-axis is delta O17. And most of the data plot around intersection between TF line and slope one lines. For the type two conjure like AMM uh, micrometeorite, uh, except for uh, all 16 rich isop ratios to data here and here, uh, close to close each other and average capital delta 17 value is 0.1 per mil. The gem sparing micrometeorite show variable, variable uh, oxygen isop ratios. So we do not uh, calculate average capital delta, delta, delta 17 value. The uh, UCMM like sample show the clustered oxygen isop ratios and the average capital delta 17 value is minus 3.3 per mil. The last one, uh, one spot data is obtained from the uh, this anhydrous IDP of which uh, capital delta 17 value is minus 1.7 per mil. So uh, here we compare capital delta 17 value and MG number. Uh, so, uh, here we compare capital delta 17 MG number trend between uh, randomly sampled micrometeorite IDP with two particles and giant cluster IDP along with CR chondrite conjure. All of them uh, show a negative trend that capital delta 17 value increase with decreasing MG number. In addition, uh, FEO rich objects have positive and negative capital delta 17 values. So regardless of uh, sampling from various comets and single comets, oxygen isop systematics are similar. So it is suggested that every comet has a common oxygen isop systematics, which is similar to that of CR chondrite conjures. So here again, uh, schematic, schematic illustration of the protoplanetary disk. The question in the introduction was, do silicate in all comets originate from the CR chondrite conjure region, formation region? The answer is yes, but uh, the number of data is still limited. So uh, more data are needed. So this is summary. 
uh, I stop uh, my talk here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? There's nothing, nothing in chat. We've still got a, a minute. Uh, it's a question from John Blaine. Let me just. You are unmuted, John. Should be able to hear you, John. I need to press that. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, right. we can. Um, this is a naive question, I'm sure, but how do you know the difference between a particle that was uh, formed in a stellar outflow um, from uh, one that was formed in the planetary disk? Why do you assume that these particles are all formed uh, in the protoplanetary disk and not earlier? You mean, a particle like uh, Plisora grain? That's right, yes. Uh, in that case, uh, the oxygen isotope ratio are uh, totally different. Okay. Of, uh, solar system value. Right, so it's very clear. That, that's all I wanted to know, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think we're ready to move on to the next talk. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, if you can stop sharing your screen. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. That's okay. Uh, I will uh, share the slides for Susan's. Or I can, I think I can share my screen. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if you prefer, I think that works. Well, let me for try me. it. There we go. Yeah. Yes. Can you see it? Okay. Uh, we can see your screen. It's not in presentation mode, but we can see the slides. Okay. Let me do the presentation mode. That should do it. There we go. Perfect. Okay, so uh, yeah, we have uh, Susan Taylor talking about um, helium-3 flux. So, right, so um, this is work that I did with Ken Farley, and it was to measure helium-3 in some samples that we collected in Antarctica from uh, Antarctic air. We built a collector, which I'll show you in a little bit, on a NASA project, um, and this is sort of a side project of that one. And then um, we also had the opportunity to melt and measure helium-3 on, uh, on ice, snow and ice core that we collect that was collected at South Pole in 1981. So helium-3 is a, oops, let me get rid of this thing. Where does this go? Let me put this, I gotta be able to see my, what I set up here, there we go. Um, helium-3 is a stable nucleide and it's uh, implanted on objects out uh, beyond our, our uh, atmosphere by the solar wind. And the wonderful thing is the three to four ratio of helium is very different uh, from the sun than it is on anything on the earth. So you can actually use the helium three to four ratio and the helium three in a way as a tracer of extraterrestrial materials. So since it's sort of a gas that's implanted on the outside, um, it's um, something that can go away fairly quickly if the particles are melted to high degrees. So most meteorites and things have this melt, um, uh, you know, they've been melted on the outside, so they've lost their helium-3 there, but smaller particles have retained that. And um, so the idea when people have made this as a, as a geochemical tracer on the Earth's surface is that it's probably the really small extraterrestrial uh, flux that is putting the helium-3 into sediments and into cores. And here I just show some of the data from Brooks that did some ice, some helium-3 measurements on ice cores, and then various people, Farley, Mark Antonio, others who did it on um, some of the large um, piston cores and the deep sea cores from the, um, the oceans. So um, in fact, uh, helium-3 has been measured on, let's see here, how do I go down one slide? Ay, ay, ay. I'm not very adept. There we go. Um, helium-3 has been measured on, inter on uh, individual interplanetary dust particles. These are generally small, as you guys probably know, like less than 20 microns, they can get big, but you know, the average is around 10, I think. Um, they're more or less unmelted, so primitive materials. And uh, they're right now collected, as you guys have heard from Mike's talk anyway, 
um, on these disks that are flown on the U-2 aircraft up in the stratosphere. So um, they've also been found in uh, IDP-like particles have been found in Antarctic uh, snow and ice as Duprat did and Dobrika did and you know, Gucci did. Uh, they've been sought after in air samples because it would be exceedingly convenient to just be able to get them from the air somewhere and not have to fly airplanes. Well, you want to have both things probably, but it would be very convenient to be able to, to have a, a nice um, uh, year long um, or a, a continuous measurement of these little guys. So that was what our project was. And so a group of us here, as you see, um, were funded to try to do this. We wanted, our goals really were to collect the IDPs from the South Pole, the Antarctic air, and to estimate their flux and their annual variability. Uh, so what we did is we built a collector. So the air suctioned in through this 20 centimeter uh, pipe. We wanted it above the saltating snow. Uh, comes in here, goes through this filter canister, who's pictured here on the right, with a three micron um, uh, hole nuclear pore. Uh, and then this is just the suction blower that, that makes all of this happen. It's a, it was very quite a simple operation. However, it filtered about a half a million cubic meters of air uh, per month. So this is about 20 times more than you'd get just from a regular um, air filter that you could buy off of the, off of the shelf. So we really wanted to um, get a lot of air through here because uh, you don't have very many particles here, so you need some sort of concentrating mechanism to, to have this happen. So um, we decided to do the helium-3 because even though we found micrometeorites, it was hard to get a flux on a lot of these things. We would be still counting them you know, for another little while. So um, it occurred that maybe we should uh, just see how the helium-3 worked and to try to estimate the flux of helium-3 and then by proxy uh, do it for the IDPs. So um, we took 13, this, this is what these filters look like, 13 of the 41 that were exposed in Antarctica were analyzed for helium-3. So it was in total 181 centimeter square, more or less, subsamples. So generally what I would do is I would cut the uh, filter sort of down the middle and make 20 little coupons each individual one of these guys, I'd wrap it up and put in the aluminum foil and then send it to Caltech where they'd put it through the mass spec. Obviously we also did, you know, um, legs. And then, as I mentioned, we had the opportunity to melt this core. So the way this core came about is one of my colleagues, um, Tony Gao was uh, uh, proving out of an electric, electrical mechanical cord Horror, as opposed to using one that uses fluids. And so they did it right there at South Pole, really close, right in the middle of the, right next to the runway, actually. And so um, they drilled this in 81, and he did all the stratigraphy on the core. And about half of the core was already used up to do other kinds of work on it. But we had half of almost all of the core bagged in one of these little tubes, as you see here on the left. Here's the bag. Uh, and they were going to get rid of it. We can't store things forever and ever at Krell. And so I said, okay, well, I'll take it. <laughs> Thank you very much. And so I just passively melted these things. I just put it in a clean uh, tube, in a funnel. In, um, I used the water. I gave it to my friend over at Dartmouth who needs light water for her oxygen isotope stuff, but we didn't really keep the water except for the Jesus water that's right at the sweet layer there between the BC and the AD, but that's a different story altogether. Anyway, um, the water went through a little uh, filter, which is a um, glass filter. And then this, I would do the same thing. I would wrap it all up, put it in one of these little, these little um, aluminum things and then send it off to Caltech. And then, then the results came back from Caltech, which was very nice. So <clears throat> the number of samples, and here's the helium-3 in these you know, funny units that they use. And you can see this is for the um, air samples. And of the 180 subsamples I sent there, 108, 178 of them had some helium-3 in them. Most of them were sort of in this area right here in this section. But we had some that had a huge amount of helium-3. 
And the one that had quite a lot, the subsample had three or four other sub subsamples that were also very high. So this is one that had quite a lot of stuff on it. Plotted a different way, here's the helium-3 and here's, um, no, this should be actually helium-3 to, oh no, here's helium-3, sorry, here's the helium-4. It's early for me, I'm sorry, I'm in California. <laughs> um, so, um, you can see all the different colors are for the different filters. So we, you know, you group them all together. So you have some, you know, the red one here is filter number eight. We know what dates we, we did all that and the flow rates, everything here, here are those ones. So you can see that there's a heterogeneity both between and among uh, the subsamples from the same filter. So you can see that some, you know, this one that's really hot, the um, uh, 17 here has some here, but it's also got one way down here. And then, so this is the helium solar wind kind of line. And so if you have more helium four, which is terrigenous in order, it sort of pulls these samples out here just to sort of give you a line. Now you might look at all this cluster and say, well, yeah, but how do you know that all this, the little, the things that hardly have any helium three in them at all are extraterrestrial? So here uh, is the helium-3 to helium-4 ratio. And remember, I was mentioning that that's um, quite specific. It's much higher in the solar wind than it is in terrestrial materials, which happen to be in this green line down here. So you see the green line is quite small. It's got a very, very low helium-3, helium-4 ratio. And even the samples that have very little helium down in here still um, have quite a, quite a high helium-3, helium-4 ratio. So we're fairly confident that all of those had extraterrestrial helium-3 in them. Okay, so 139 of the 141 ice cores, these were meter long ice cores that had been like um, 10 centimeters in diameter, but since they were cut in half, they were smaller. And we melted the whole thing for one sample. So here's, here's the count, and then this is the helium-3 here. Um, uh, there's a bit of a disconnect because we plotted these as 10 to the minus 12, and the last one on the air is 10 to the minus 15. So these are actually fairly high. These are about 100 times higher than the other ones. So I'll show you in the next one where I plot the helium-3 here to the helium-4. And this is the black guys are all the, the ones from the core. And you can see we've got some high ones up along the, the same line. And then just for comparison, I put the samples for um, the um, filter 17, which is the really high one from our um, last one here, a lot, multiplied by 100 up along this, just for comparison. But um, this is a reasonable thing. I haven't time normalized these things yet. And if you did do that, since the cores are 10 year, represent 10 years of deposition, um, it's, it's an okay thing to do. Okay. So then the, the, one of the main points or the things that we thought would be really fun is to calculate the fluxes for these, for both the um, core and for the air samples, and then also calculate the flux for the IDP. So we have two numerical uh, concentrations of number of IDPs per meter square of air that uh, one of them, Mike Zelensky and McKinnon did, and the other one, Don Brownlee did quite a long time ago, which would be nice to do some more of those actually, I think. But anyway, what we did uh, to calculate these fluxes is we have the average helium values for all the centimeters squared little sections of the air. Uh, and it was about this amount. And along with the air volume that we filtered, because we know that we measured that, the filter area sampled, we know that. And here's the flux for for um, the air filters that we did in Antarctica. For the ice cores, um, we have the average value of this. So you can see that here's this sort of disconnect here, or just difference. Uh, each core represents about 10 years of deposition and the core section was 40 centimeters squared. So we calculated the flux of this. And then for the two IDP numerical concentrations um, that we got from the literature, uh, we used an average uh, helium-3 concentrations in IDPs that was um, given by Pepin, uh, a one centimeter per second settling velocity, uh, average 10 micron IDP um, um, size, and a density of one gram per centimeter cubed. 
and it yields two different things because we had two different numerical concentrations. So when we plot these in that first, um, add these to that plot that I showed you in the second slide here. So here's our ice core here, which is quite nice with the other ice cores. Here's our um, air sample, and here's the, the two IDP measurements. And um, I suppose I was surprised, actually. I thought, well, geez, you know, you've got these IDPs coming through the atmosphere, and then they get deposited. Um, and then you have, you have their signal sort of preserved for 100 million years. I mean, <laughs> it seems pretty amazing to me that that would happen, that they have. So um, I don't know if it's in if it's in the um, magnetite or exactly where this um, helium three is stored that it can that is Im embedded or imprinted that could last that long. So this is the summary. Uh, we measured the helium three flux in terrestrial surface air. Uh, this hadn't been done before and it sort of provides a link in the flux measured in the stratosphere with the helium three, the IDP flux measured in the stratosphere with the helium three flux measurements made on ice um, cores and on deep sea sediments. Um, there are very large uncertainties in some of these values like the IDP for the average concentration from Pepin, he gave the average concentration, but then there was like a, a, a factor of a hundred, I think variation in this. So. You have to sort of there's quite a lot of variation in the in the helium three in the IDPs themselves. Um, so even though despite these uncertainties, variation in the helium three flux among all these different archives on Earth and one to a hundred million year time scales are within sort of a factor of two. So um, and then this also strengthens the idea that the IDPs are actually carrying the helium three to the Earth and that that's that they are the main. Um, source of this, um, of, of the carrier. So, and then uh, if you want more information, we got a couple of papers out. So the Farley one just came out. Um, and then um, this one is the first one, the Taylor one is the one that really talks about how we sampled the, um, the, the uh, Antarctic air. So that has a lot of different details and it also shows a lot of the analysis we did on the particles and this and that and the other thing. This one is just kind of like the offshoot of that and is um, is the work that we did with the helium three and then we were able to add the core which was really quite splendid. So um, that's all I have. If you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Susan. Uh, you, you talked for the, the, the full time. So uh, I, I think we I might talked be able to, to come what? back to uh, for the full time window, but uh, oh, okay. I, I didn't stop you because it was it was very interesting. Anyway, okay. we might have questions. Um, Sorry, you know, I had my talk. sure. I had my phone on to ring me, and I didn't. I didn't hear it. All right. No Let worries. Me. If you uh, stop sharing, I will. Uh, I, okay, stop sharing. There we go. Great. Cheers. Uh, so Cecile, you're already a panelist. So you should be able to um, share your screen. And Cecile will be talking about organics and minerals, and you can see. Uh, at the moment, we're seeing your kind of. Uh, presentation screen or oh, yeah that okay that's correct thanks take it away so so we uh, can't hear you so you're still muted So is it okay now? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. Well, thank you for organizing this uh, this day. It's really nice, even though when you're not a panelist, you cannot see the others, but uh, it's nice. <laughs> <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about uh, UCAMS. Uh, Jean already introduced it, so I will go a bit. Uh, fast on the on the first. So of course, like as usual, uh, this is not a, a work that we do we do by ourselves. So we are part of a consortium and working with many people over the uh, the world. So as you know, there are two families of uh, um, particles 
that we find in the Concordia collection, um, the chondritic micrometeorites, which are about 99% of the ones we recover. Um, they mostly have uh, similarities with uh, carbonaceous chondrites. And then there are the UCAMs, which are rare, and uh, they have a very high deuterium to hydrogen ratios. They contain a lot of carbon. And I will explain a little bit uh, what they are made of. So this is a summary slide of the UCAM. So they are, um, the backscattered electron images are very dark uh, on, a, on a carbon substrate. The EDX spectrum contain, uh, is dominated by, by carbon, but they still contain the rock forming elements. And the, the term to hydrogen ratios are um, uh, really, really high, uh, speaking for very low uh, temperature formation of the organics. So they are reminiscent of the Sean particles that were found on the comet Halley. And uh, they, they were probably formed in the very outer regions of the protoplanet red disk. So, so far we have uh, about 20 uh, UCAMs. This is a picture of uh, 16 of them. Um, they, they do have a uh, diverse uh, um, proportions of mineral and organics. Uh, some of them do show that they have been heated a little bit during atmospheric entry, uh, but it's still a, a wonder how we can recover such a high carbon particle uh, coming from comets, probably uh, arriving at really high speeds. So the first analysis showed that uh, the, this, this uh, nitrogen, these micrometeorites uh, have an organic matter, which is uh, very uh, high in nitrogen. Um, on the right, you have the um, FTIR spectra of uh, UCAMs, and they are, they are actually ordered with decreasing amount of uh, um, minerals, which are shown on the right here, silicates, so olivine and pyroxene. Here you have about half uh, in the volume of minerals and, and the rest is organics. And uh, in, in the number 65 here, it's almost no organics and everything, no minerals and everything is uh, organics. And one of the striking features is that the, um, this particle contain a lot of uh, nitrogen in the organic matter. And sometimes the, the nitrile peak is even seen uh, in, in the spectra. And uh, this is very unusual. This kind of organic matter does not exist in the, in the meteorite. So um, <clears throat> when you go in more details, so this is the from the PhD uh, thesis of uh, Baptiste Guerra. <clears throat> um, you can find that um, there are in fact, three kinds of organic matter in the UCAMs. So the, the nitrogen rich, so these are uh, false color images um, from, uh, micro, from FIB sections of UCAMs. And uh, the red phase contains a lot of nitrogen. The blue one is uh, like the IOM in meteorites, so we call it low uh, nitrogen. And the green is this dusty patches that we have sometimes in the, in the in the low nitrogen organic matter. This has been seen also in uh, UCAMs from, uh, from Japan by uh, Hikaru Yabuta. And um, there is a distinction between the mineral contents of the, orga of the, of the organics. The, um, the high nitrogen organic matter does not contain crystalline minerals, whereas the, the, the low nitrogen organics can contain minerals, um, crystalline and, some, and, and also Amorphous. Sometimes in the in the red in the high nitrogen organics we can have some gems, but but no crystalline minerals. So <clears throat> Jean uh, discussed it in more details. The the way of forming this uh, nitrogen rich organic matter could be uh, by irradiation of nitrogen rich ices in the very far regions of the um, protoplanetary disks where you can have nitrogen rich and methane rich um, ices at the surface of the small bodies. And by irradiation with the galactic, galactic cosmic ray, then you can uh, produce an organic residue, um, which when you, when you heat the ice um, um, forms and then uh, the spectroscopic signature of this residue uh, is shown here looks very much like the spectroscopic signature in the infrared of the of the UCAMs. 
So this is a possibility uh, of forming this uh, a very unusual organic matter <clears throat> in the external regions of the protoplanetary disk. There are other um, propositions by uh, UV photolysis of ICES, um, but this the, the problem with UV is that it doesn't uh, penetrate very much in the ICES, whereas the galactic cosmic ray can uh, penetrate um, a, a meter or so, or a bit more. <clears throat> so the other form of organics that you can find in the UCAMs as well as in other primitive bodies is uh, nanoglobules. So <clears throat> this is a summary slide where you have um, uh, nanoglobules, which are found in different kinds of meteorites, I mean, V2, <clears throat> in uh, chondritic micrometeorites as well. UCAMs, Tagish Lake, IDPs. <clears throat> this kind of uh, nanoglobules, um, their origin is not well known where they come from, but the, the characteristics that they are found in the, in the primitive uh, um, extraterrestrial material. So there are different um, hypotheses about their formation, um, but so far I don't think there is a consensus. Going to minerals, um, so minerals are included directly in the organics and um, they, they are very variable. They contain olivine, uh, peroxines, uh, iron sulfide, and, uh, and mostly gems. So this is a, a graph from uh, Elena Derbica's paper. So this is the phosphorite number um, for olivine uh, in orange and peroxines in purple. And you see that you have a wide range of composition of these uh, minerals in three different UGAMs here. And as uh, Mike noticed, um, also this would look like uh, we'll do samples for the for the olivines. Um, I don't know if this if there is similar uh, perks in data for for will two. There is, uh, like we discussed, there is no sharp peak at uh, phosphorite one hundred for these uh, minerals, at least for the olivines. Um, but the the peroxines tend to have a, a better magnesium rich uh, composition. One thing that is usually systematically seen is that uh, compared to meteorites, uh, there is more peroxines than in the meteorites. So the, the in numbers, so the peroxine to olivine um, is uh, is higher. That's something that seems to be uh, the case for <clears throat> uh, samples that are from uh, from comets. And, uh, and uh, gems are also present. Uh, I'll discuss this later. So this is a summary of the composition of silicates and uh, iron sulfides um, on the ternary plot. So you see that the uh, compositions are um, more on the magnesium rich side, but can also extend. And uh, Baptiste uh, Guerin during his PhD used uh, uh, different methods for um, measuring the composition of minerals on the TEM, as you can see on the, on the top right here. He used the PCA to actually uh, add all the pixels corresponding to uh, um, um, phases, which look similar. And there is, uh, in this uh, mineral aggregates, there is some kind of a matrix, which he called silicon-rich matrix, because it's sometimes very rich in, in, in silicon. <clears throat> Uh, these samples contain uh, uh, iron sulfides uh, from trollite to pyrotite <clears throat> and sometimes uh, pentlandite, but uh, that's pretty rare. Um, there are some uh, uh, aggregates that looks like chondrule. So uh, they, they were found so far in uh, three different UCAMs. You can have uh, uh, three different examples here. This is from uh, Elena Dobrika's uh, paper. And uh, this is from Baptiste's work where you see here um, um, hypocrystalline object that looks like a, a, a crystal. Uh, we have not found uh, refractory minerals so far in uh, in UCAMs. <clears throat> and uh, recently, also in uh, Baptiste's work, um, in the one UCAM, we found a fibrous mineral that you can see here, which looks like a phyllosilicate. So this is very interesting because that would mean that uh, hydrous uh, minerals are present in, in, in cometary material. But uh, unfortunately, this the sample was lost during manipulation, so we couldn't do uh, any more 
uh, characterization, but the composition of this uh, um, fibrous phase is uh, the, the blue uh, dot here. It's very aluminum rich. It's close to the um, area which corresponds to phyllosilicates from, 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 from gems alteration uh, from uh, Keiko's work. So we don't know if this uh, uh, fibrous phase was uh, made um, in a comet or, or if it's pre-accretionary. I'll go very quickly over the gems. So gems are present in uh, UCAMs as uh, in IDPs and maybe in, in BIL2. And I just want to mention a new technique that was used uh, uh, on the UCAMs, which is the infrared nanospectroscopy. So it allows the characterization of minerals and organics at the submicron scale in the, in the mid-infrared regime. And uh, this is a technique that was invented uh, in Orsay uh, by Alexandre Dazi. And uh, we are using it now to uh, um, uh, characterize the samples at the submicron scale. And also, um, uh, this is also uh, uh, sometimes possible to correlate with nanoSIMS measurement because the measurements are made about at the same scale. So, a quick summary um, the organic matter of UCAMs uh, speak for a very low uh, temperature formation. The nitrogen-rich organic matter uh, was probably formed in situ uh, in very cold and far regions. The nitrogen poor looks similar to what's found in the, in the meteorites. And then minerals, um, there is a wide variety of mineral phases, uh, which were probably formed in uh, close to the sun. The hydrated phases uh, is puzzling. And then uh, there is a different differences between uh, minerals in meteorites in terms of composition and uh, sizes, maybe uh, speaking for a size sorting effect during ejection to the outer regions. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was uh, really interesting. So if uh, we have questions for either uh, Susan's or Cecil's talk, uh, I think now's a good time. So uh, I think we've got John Play. Let me just unmute you, John. Well, John said that it has to go to another meeting. Oh, Mike said that there is a paper on V2 peroxine available soon. Great. That's great. So it may be that everybody is, is, is desperate to have the tea break. Maybe. Just before we go, can I ask a kind of practical question about these? Do you uh, mount them in indium or, or gold foil uh, when you analyze them? Or how else do you kind of uh, do the at least the initial work before the TEM? Uh, we split every particles in several fragments. Then we do one fragment. Um, we put one fragment on the carbon tape. So this is the, the ones we hear. Uh, this is on carbon tape. <clears throat> and then uh, ACM is the method we use to uh, actually um, find them because they're pretty rare. Um, so our um, assistant engineer, uh, lab manager, Lucy Deloche, is actually doing uh, a lot of this work. <clears throat> and then after, after that, we do uh, systematically infrared measurements uh, in collaboration with Emmanuel D'Artois. Uh, and this is the final um, the final uh, decision that, that they are UCAMs or that they are not uh, extraterrestrial because um, um, we need to have the mixtures with the minerals. And, uh, and then after that, if we have a doubt, we, we have to make nanosims. So for infrared uh, measurements, we crush them on diamond windows. Okay. Well, <laughs> that, that's so different from all other micrometeorite types with that extreme amount of organics. Uh, yeah. I can see the challenges in identifying. Yeah, it's pretty stressful handling them. We don't have many of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a, a quick question. Do, do you see any evidence for, for thermal alteration? Is there is any of the organic material being graphitized? <clears throat> Um, that's a good question. Since they are very nitrogen rich, uh, they're pretty resistant toward uh, um, heating. 
Um, but there are particles, for instance, the, the one here, I don't know if you see my, my yeah. mouse. This one has, has a lot of vesicles. And um, so we think this one has been heated. Um, but we, what we guess from the, from, and also you see here that the aliphatics, the CH bondings, sometimes they are present, sometimes they're not present at all. And we still don't know if this is an atmospheric entry feature or not. Um, but our guess is that they, they were not heated to, to more than a few hundred degrees. Because otherwise they, they, they would not have survived. So, and this one, if any one of you have a, this one is very peculiar and this, we think this is a carbonate here. We have no clue how it got there. Carbonate, <laughs> such a good potential for fluids and temperature inferences on the parent body. Right. Um, okay. But thanks for oh. the paper, Martin. Now we know that sometimes you can have a good saturation in comments. So. <laughs> <laughs> I see, yeah, I'd love to explore that more, looking at a few of these. And, uh, it's a shame you lost the one with the phyllo silicate. Yeah. yeah. Well, we do hey. have a hydrated silicate. So. Sorry, say again? We do have a hydrated silicate in here. This is probably hydrated silicate. Yeah, well, I'm convinced that's fine silicate. Yeah, yeah, no, so, so that, that isn't the one that, that's lost. You still have that one, do you? Right, yeah, yep, yep. Amazing. Uh, I, I, I think we should take a 10 minute break and return at three o'clock for William Liley's talk about Project Stardust. Uh, so, uh, I hope you enjoyed this uh, afternoon session and uh, thank all the speakers for their fascinating talks. So thank you very much. Hello. Hello. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't realize I was coming on next. Um, yeah, you can start sharing your, your, your presentation. Yeah, I have a, we had a problem. My, uh, student who was going who has the <laughs> slides and was going to do most of the presentation has come down six and is now out to hospital so oh, okay. i will have to do like a quick summary and uh <laughs> have to t uh tell you what we've what i've i've been doing and uh she is a uh, senior student undergraduate at the University of Oregon and uh, getting ready to graduate this semester. I have moved uh, from Oregon to New York um, and we're still waiting for results from NASA from our uh, samples. So I don't have the uh, SEM scans for our samples. Uh, I think this tags along pretty well with Sarah's uh, presentation of what she was doing in Wales. I've been doing it with uh, undergraduate students and getting a very positive response. Um, the uh, students be able to do fr really frontline research. And it's really very simple. We uh, got a grant from NASA back in uh, uh, 2019 and then had to go uh, just getting started. We had four students, I had four students uh, working on the project and then the COVID hit. Um, we did get to collect samples from various environments. We were trying to try some different environments. Of course we did roofs um, and it turned out the uh, high school roof in the city we were the colleges was the best uh, sampling we did. Uh, we tried beaches, we tried streams, we tried uh, to, um, weathered rock. Uh, that that none of those re yielded anything of value we could find. Uh, we learned also that sampling <laughs> sampling within about a hundred yards of a beach. Uh, we were just overwhelmed by beach sand. We just uh, we could we sampled several roofs near the ocean and 
the beach sand just overwhelms everything. So yeah, we, were lucky to, we were lucky to get the high school, which is probably almost a mile inland and about a two or 300 feet elevation to get the best sample. Um, and uh, NASA also wanted us to go out in the ocean and we had three dates for uh, ocean sampling and all were canceled because of COVID. So, uh, but uh, I found the students were very, uh, very interested. <sighs> this is, this is our uh, project. <laughs> um, we got very good sort of support from NASA, though, uh, when we sent them the samples, their lab was shut down and we couldn't, we couldn't get the actual scans. Uh, had said, but they looked at the, uh, Dr. Freeze looked at the microscope and said they are definitely some, we had about 50 samples we sent them and he said definitely some of those are meteors, um, but we don't have the scans yet. They're in, they're in line, they've reopened the lab, but we're somewhere down the line in, in getting this. Um, and I have since moved to New York and uh, now affiliated with the State University of New York and uh, we're, I'm gonna start another uh, project there. I've got students that are anxious. Unfortunately, the weather closed in before we could sample. Um, so in the spring, we will continue this. And I just uh, think this is a great, great project for students. It's, uh, they're really, uh, they can really, once you, they go through the, getting the sample and getting it uh, sieved and washed and and under the microscope, they can do it on their own. They don't have to uh, require much supervision. I kind of do quality control on their samples, but uh, they, they were very good at uh, working by themselves and uh, keeping the project going, even, even through the pandemic, so. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, we actually, uh, we're starting a similar project here and it's extremely popular, the students. Yeah. Always, always. And, uh, and actually some students wanted to sample uh, next to a beach and uh, I, I advised against that because yes. <laughs> well, our, sample, our students wanted to sample the snow, but I, I told them the quantity that we have to collect. Um, so we're hoping at least in the spring when we have the meltdown, maybe they can sample some of the snow. But it was, uh, it would be, uh, more than we could handle. <laughs> if, if. <laughs> uh, we NASA had asked us to put in a proposal to go to Antarctica. Uh, unfortunately, the COVID, we didn't get to go. We didn't put in the samples. So I'm anxious to see how it was going down there. I'm excited. Hopefully, my new group of students, I will be able to put in a proposal to go down and uh, and and. Uh, sample in Antarctica. Yeah, certainly. It's the best place. Yeah. <laughs> With the Atacama Desert. <laughs> yeah, I, I told the other professor, why go to Antarctica? I says, it's my dream to go to Antarctica <laughs> for a it's geologist. <laughs> yeah. But I've enjoyed these talks. And um, is this going to be available so I can yeah. use it to? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's being recorded, and uh, we will edit uh, the, 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 the video and uh, upload it to YouTube. I think so. Yeah. Once once the video is available, I will send a link to everyone. So. Yeah, my uh, uh, some of my students will find it's very interesting to see that you know what what it's used for. That's what they keep asking me. What are we going to find? And I says, well, we don't know yet. <laughs> No. This is new. <laughs> it's not cutting edge of science. You don't know what you're going to find. Yes. So that's my uh, quick update. And sorry, my partner couldn't be here to uh, show you all the. Uh, I trust you can understand it. Yeah. yeah. Found some really beautiful ones. I'm amazed at the colors and the. Uh, and, and actually we have one we call the, the rooster. It's one with a tail on it. 
I'm not sure whether they're in meteors or not, but they're beautiful to look at. And you're right, the students see a lot of other things. I mean, I see things I didn't know and the biologists had to tell me. <laughs> Oh, yeah, those are eggs from, uh, you know, blah, 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 insect. And I said, I didn't know what they were. <laughs> the Martin did study urban micrometeorites, tails recently, tailed micrometeorites. Didn't you, Martin? Sorry, say again. Uh, tailed micrometeorites from the German collection. Yeah, that's right. Thilo has um, collected a whole bunch uh, from a single rooftop. Uh, and came to me and said, look what I found. And it was 315 particles from a single roof. So I thought that was pretty cool. And we looked at that and tried to do a flux uh, estimate because we know when the building was built and you know the area exactly. So. Okay. So if anyone, uh, Matt, I will tell you, uh, let you handle questions. Tiny. Um, yes, so anybody have any questions, um, just put, put them into the chat. Um, so you, it, 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 it sounds like, William, you, you, you try to sample a very wide range of different places indeed. Um, what, was, what was the, did you have any surprises? Did you find micrometeorites anywhere you really weren't expecting to find them? No. <laughs> <laughs> Roofs, <laughs> drains, we're it. Right. So none in the natural samples, none in rivers, and none. none. No, it's just too much of quantity of other stuff. And not finding any, I mean, you get to the point where after you spend hours and not finding anything, you just have to give up on. Well, of course, us, us people who look at Antarctic material are spoiled. Yeah. <laughs> Because we, you know, we don't go more than ten minutes without finding a cosmic spherule. <laughs> Two minutes. <laughs> yeah, well, you're faster than I am. If that, uh, yeah. <laughs> some of these. Well, are uh, when I went there, I found like uh, I started finding some after ten seconds putting the sample under the microscope, and I would find one every ten seconds. Little, it was just nonstop. <laughs> It's too easy. Yes, let's send kids to Antarctica. <laughs> I always thought it was very unfair that children aren't allowed to go to Antarctica. <laughs> really, children and dogs, my two favorite things. <laughs> okay. So it might, be, it might be a good point if anybody's got any questions about previous talks or previous posters, um, feel free to free to ask. And if the, if the speaker isn't here, then we will make up an answer. Yes. Oh, there are Chilean children who live in the Antarctic. They're very chilly. <sighs> Okay, well, I think we'll move on to the next and last talk, but last but not least. Uh, hello, Scott. Good morning. Good morning or good afternoon for all you, right? <clears throat> oh, well. Uh, yeah, and I know it's probably been a lot of amazing uh, talk so far. Yes, well, thank you, William. It was fantastic. And now, I will let you share uh, your presentation. Do, do you have it on your end, or do you want me to share it uh, just to like? I can screen? share it. Yes. I just I'm on my old computer and uh, um, yeah. the. Yeah. <coughs> no, I, I just computer. share it myself. It's not a problem. I can just jump on another computer if it works. Uh, I think that's the one. Voila. Perfect. So, I take it away? Yes, please. Um, so, I am Scott Peterson. I know uh, most of you already, I believe. Um, thanks for having me here today, this morning. Um, so, I collect micrometeorites from rooftops. Can we 
switch to the next one. Um, <clears throat> this rooftop is actually located not too far from my house. Um, it was an abandoned mall. And it's, it's a funny story. I, I wanted to go up on it for the longest time beforehand. And um, it was impossible because there's security guards that was all blocked off. They were gonna change it into like a big store, but they never did. So they had like security guards that would stay there 24 seven. And one day I just went up to one of the security guards and asked if I could go up on the roof. And she said, yes. So I ran home, got my ladder and, and went up on top of the roof. And um, it's, it's a, as far as roofs go, it's a, it's a pretty odd one. I, this is where I found uh, a large percentage of my, uh, my community. So it's over 500 just from this one uh, location. And <clears throat> from the, where I collected on the roof is it's all on the, the back side. So the closest side to that where it says um, Highway 169, all of the wind and rain kind of pushed it all to, to one side. And so I collected just basically right along that uh, side. And that's where I got the most micrometeorites that I've ever found on a roof. Usually, like if I find 20, I'll be happy. If, I find 100, that's really good too, but like over 500 was, was pretty amazing. And I've tried to go back, um, but they've been more uh, more guarding and they, they won't let me back up. So I was, I was lucky to get up when I could. I can do the next slide. Uh, so this is where I keep them and I've kind of showed some of you before. Um, it's on the picture on the left, that's my entire collection all 2,000 plus of them. Um, I've actually got more that I haven't put in there yet that I got to uh, assign numbers, but I just, I 3D printed that little white area on them and I put them in a little glass slide container. Um, and that's kind of how I hold them. I number them, there's 20 for each circle. So I have a hundred in each slide and it's worked out pretty well so far. It's kind of a, it's nice to be able to put 2,000 meteorites in such a, a small area. We can do the next slide. Uh, I am fortunate enough to have been able to use the University of Minnesota's lab. Um, I can do almost anything there, and it's been pretty pretty amazing. But the the lady that I was working with is moving to uh, to Canada for another job. So hopefully I'll be able to work with a new person, but it's kind of up in the air right now. So I don't know if I'll be able to, to go back in at this moment, but I've been able to get pretty amazing images in my opinion. You can go next slide. Uh, here's some of the recent ones from my last session. I'm sure you guys have seen some of these already. Um, they're just two of my favorites from, from the last session, pretty, ugly ones, but beautiful in their own right. Uh, next slide. And some extreme close-ups. Um, it just always blows my mind when I'm able to see how small they are and then zoom in. I've been able to go in to the lab quite a bit and I hope you guys all feel the same, but every time I get to just zoom in and see them so close, it's pretty amazing. Next slide. Um, so the one on the left is um, again, from the, the last session. And then the one on the right is taken with my trusty microscope right here. Um, actually, I, I put it on the silicone. Wafer. Sometimes I put them on just this reflective mirror of a silicon wafer, and that makes the black background. But this one is actually on, it was still on the uh, um, black carbon tape. I didn't move it yet, and I just took the image of it right there. I go to the next slide. This is, don't judge me how dirty it is. I just took this photo last night and I didn't clean up, but uh, this is my Olympus BAH, BH2. Um, you can see I got the lighting that comes behind it. And then uh, my Nikon on top. My, I say this all the time, but my favorite part of the entire thing is these little 3D printed light diffusers that I make. Um, I shared a picture the other day. There's, when the light shines on them, cause they're so, new and reflective it's it's hard to image them because there's so much light bouncing off of them but i just i print these little 3d uh 
diffusers right on my printer behind me and they just break up the lights so well that I'll be able to get all that detail that I that I like. You know, like next quote, next one. Um, so I haven't even, this is a never before seen photo. <laughs> um, I just took this one the other day. I went beautiful little uh, turtle back. You can see how close it, <coughs> excuse me, how close I can get in with the, the detail. Um, it's pretty remarkable just from <laughs> The first image that I took, like back in uh, 2017, it was like looking back at it now, it was just horrible. It's it's what I usually get when people send me photos of, of pictures. They just kind of go through their USB microscope or something, and then they try to ask me if they can, if it's a micrometer, if I can identify it or not. And it's so impossible to do it. But now I've gone from there to to being able to get pretty detailed images of these things and they're so small. It's pretty amazing that all the light can get into those little nooks and crannies. And then uh, next slide. Here's a, another one. I love this one. This is, I just took this one the other day too. It's unique, right? Like the, the left part is all porphyritic and shiny and clean. And there's a little bar of area inside there. It's, this is one of my, uh, one of my favorite ones. You know, next slide. Uh, this is all the same micrometer. I just did it from three different angles. Um, the first one on the far left is like a, like looking into a bowl. Uh, the second one in the middle is on its side, and then if they have top sides and bottoms, whatever. And then the top one or the one on the far right would be of the top. I can say this a million times, but it, it also is one of my favorites. Uh, and then next slide. I don't know if you guys have come across this too often, but uh, once in a while I'll find just like really yellow micrometeorites. I don't find them too much. Um, this is probably like my third or fourth one that I've ever that I've ever found. <laughs> uh, I've told the story before too, but uh, sometimes uh, the micrometeorites will get lost from where I am right now, and they'll land in the carpet. And I had this really beautiful. Uh, yellowish micrometeorite, similar to this one, a little bit different. Uh, it was really big in size too, and I lost it. So it's in my carpet somewhere, but I don't know. Um, hopefully, I'll find it someday if I vacuum behind there and, and find it. Let me go to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> still today, I think one of the coolest things that I was able to do with uh, some help of you guys is. Um, be able to polish the micrometeorites. So this is an image showing the entire uh, micrometeorite, then just having it polished on one side, and then the, um, <clears throat> the elemental mapping. And then uh, after that, it was polished on the other side. And the bottom image is just regular light shining through it, then um, cross-polarized light, and then cross-polarized light with the uh, wave plate on it. Still, I just, yeah, probably the, still the coolest thing I think I've been able to do was, was be able to do that. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> but I, so I, I mostly find them on roofs, but that's not the only place that I'm able to find on it. Um, this is actually, my house is probably five or six uh, houses down from there. And I found one right in the gutter. Um, right by my house. I, it's, it's pretty amazing. So, you know, like if, if it's on a roof, you can kind of guess the age of it just because um, the roof can only be so old. I found probably like six or seven now just on roads. And I, I don't know if anybody else has ever done this, but um, there's, I found one and it was really, really, really fresh. It was just glass looking. It was very shiny. And it was not there the day before. And, and then it was there next. So it's, it's hard to guess the age of it. I wonder uh, if there'd be a way to do that, but um, it's, it's a fun, I think the other gentleman was just talking about how uh, searching under the, the microscope for a couple hours, that's usually what I have to do because there's so much pollution uh, on the roads, but I still just do it for fun so I can find them on the road. Next slide. 
Uh, also, with uh, some help with some friends, been able to find them in the North Atlantic Ocean, that spot right there where the um, arrow is uh, at. We found this one. So he was actually uh, able to collect them and I just sent them to me. So I didn't really do too much except look through them, but nonetheless. And then next slide. Um, <clears throat> I'll say it again. This is one of my favorite photos of a micrometer, I think. Again, I'll say it all the time, but it's still kind of true. I just love the way that this one looks. Uh, and this one was found uh, at the bottom of Lake Michigan. Next slide. And they're, <laughs> they're so fragile. They're, I just uh, brought one into the last lab session I did and just removing it from the carbon tape because the carbon tape is so sticky, they'll just fall apart. And I've tried to uh, cross polarize some of those flakes because uh, they're so thin, but it didn't really work out. It's just, it's impossible to move them. So I have like a whole little uh, slide dedicated to all of the crumbles of the micrometers that once were. Uh, next slide. And I like to do just fun photos as well. Uh, this one is um, sitting on the, um, the mesh of uh, a sieve. This was a number 80 sieve, I believe. So this is a pretty decent, not decent size, but pretty small, decent sized uh, micrometer at resting on, on the, the screen. Next slide. This one I took not too long ago. I found this <clears throat> spider in my house. It's a jumping spider and I could just rest him vertically um, as he was no longer living. And I just set a micrometeorite on it. And then I took this photo. I always like doing these ones. I don't know. It's pretty neat. I love jumping spiders and I love micrometeorites. So putting them together is pretty, pretty fun. Uh, next slide. This one is resting on the top of my iPhone. I use my iPhone as a, uh, as a little holder. So, you know, you zoom in, you can see the pixels. So that gives a kind of uh, amazing scale right there. Uh, next slide. And <laughs> I just threw this one in for fun because I just I love it so much. But when even when I just noticed that when we were in the lab, it, that little hole of a squirrel that is hanging out on the micrometer, it's pretty amazing. Uh, next slide. So I don't know if you can play that. If not, it's fine. So this is. My dream basically now is just to be able to um, get a rotational image of a, um, a microarray. This is a video of it kind of spinning on the, on the head of a needle um, or something similar. I can't remember what I used. But I have a 360 kind of view of it. And if I stack those images up enough and I could get the, the data that I needed, I want to be able to like hold like a basketball size or a football sized uh, micrometeorite. So that's the, the goal. You can go next slide. <clears throat> this is another image of it. So it's not great imagery yet. I have to figure out a lot of things, but um, if I can get it to rotate, this is one image of multiple that is in a series. Um, it's kind of rotating. It did a decent job, but I still I need more information, more data from the, um, from the stacks and I want to be able to just precisely turn it and do it all the way. So uh, that's it. Thank you guys so much. I truly uh, I want to thank everybody. I really, really do appreciate all your help with everything. So that's it. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, guys. Um, does anybody have any pictures of Scott? I think, Scott, that, that you know, admitting to, to dropping micrometrites into the carpet is absolutely the right thing to communicate to some of the PhD students who are here. <laughs> that even professionals occasionally drop their micrometrites and there are thank thankfully plenty more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Especially when you can find them one or two minutes after apart from each other from the Antarctic samples. <laughs> so Sarah Roberts is saying in chat that she absolutely loves your, your um, spider holding photographs and um, she would love to show these photographs in, in, in schools. 
Um, yeah, I'm, absolutely. I think, yeah, I have, I have permission to grant it if I already have before. Um, yeah, I love them too. So share them away. Well, I, you know, I think I think this this could well be uh, the start of a new exhibition at the National History Museum, um, along the lines of cats in hats, but with <laughs> spiders with micrometeorites. Exactly. Well, I've taken two so far. I don't know about this series. If I'd have to take some more, but yeah, I got two ready to go. If you could do a spider football game, yes, that's what. Yes, have them kick it around. <laughs> I don't. I'm not really great at training animals, but I'll give it a shot. So do, do you, have you managed to, to find many eye types? You've actually managed to, to recognize them? Because I know it's a, a big problem with the artificial material. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I took um, like two or three <clears throat> into the session last time. And I, they, they have, from what I've noticed, they've had this certain physical characteristics that you can kind of visually tell what they are. So I've, I've tried to find ones that have that pattern, um, but I don't think I would know necessarily how to absolutely confirm that they are eye types besides visual. Like you can't chemically confirm it, right? Or can you? Um, so it's easy to, conf so if they are contain chromium or aluminium, um, a fair amount of silicon, then they are very unlikely to be, to be an eye type. Cosmic spherule. Um, some eye types contain very little nickel, below 0.1. So it's those just iron oxide spherules that are really difficult to decide whether they're terrestrial or not. And I can see that, that Jean, Jean has got a, a question, Jean Dupra. So I will just unmute you, Jean. Please go ahead. Do you hear me? Yes, I do. Yeah, great image. Congratulations. Um, I would have a question. How did you? How did you manage to pick up micrometeorite on the road in your neighborhood? This is this is amazing. This is fantastic. So I I search everywhere I can. Like I just I bring the magnet with me everywhere I go. I want to collect them on. I'm in Minnesota right now, so there's snow everywhere. I want to get them off the snow. I, when I'm bored, I just I go out to the road. So I have this powerful neodymium magnet, the same one that I use when I go. Um, up on rooftops and it's I mean it's funny it's almost laughable right so I'll take this this uh magnet and a, and a ziploc bag and I'll go up to that little dirt area that you saw in the photo and it's just you can hold it like 10 feet away and all of the magnetic material will come stick to the magnet just because there's so much pollution there um but I'll go through it all and I'll just do the same thing that I do uh with the rooftop material I'll just I'll clean it so it's easier to spot out anything. Um, and then I'll just look and look and look and get probably like, right, I mean, I've been on some roofs where I found a, a, like too much pollution, um, worse than on the roads, but usually even on the roads, I'll, I'll look through, um, I don't know, thousands of, of little spheres before I'll find like a possible micrometeorite. And a lot of times it's, I don't find anything on the road, but uh, I think it's such a, a rare occurrence that I, I like to give it a shot just because it's it's not very likely so I, I do it anyway. Thank you sorry to interrupt but uh, I hope we have many opportunities to communicate all of us but I'm afraid that they will kick us out in the one minute because they have to we have to stop at 3 30 sharp here in the UK so I would like to uh, thank the speakers uh, with fantastic talks. It was a great meeting. I'm very happy. And I would like to thank everyone for attending and uh, thank the co organizers for hosting this great meeting. And I think now we have to go. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. And I hope to speak to you uh, soon about a potential paper, a review paper on the current studies on micrometeorites. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yeah. Hope Thank to you. talk to you guys soon. See you. Yeah. Thanks See for you. joining everyone. And yeah. Bye, awesome everyone. talks. Thanks.